Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, um, this uh, next panel on the uh, 10th uh, South South Forum on Sustainability. Um, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I am uh, Lisa, Lisa Leung. Uh, I am a associate professor of the Department of Cultural Studies, uh, a colleague who's been admiring uh, the wonderful work that uh, Kinchi has been doing all these years, especially on uh, uh, Global University of Sustainability. So uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm helping out uh, uh, at this panel. Uh, I myself do research on uh, South Asians uh, in Hong Kong who um, under the framing of ethnic minorities, uh, if people want to hear more, I can talk about it later on. Uh, but uh, my interest uh, in sustainability is uh, at a very novice level. I mean, I have a lot of interest, but my knowledge about sustainability is at a novice level. So I have a lot to learn uh, uh, from people at this panel. Um, so yesterday, uh, on July the 15th, we had two wonderful sessions of discussions on the theme of rural regeneration in East Asia. So I guess today uh, we're going to continue on this theme, uh, but also situating at you know various locales within Asia, with uh, the theme on uh, more on spirituality. Uh, the title of this uh, panel is "Spirit and Philosophy in Permaculture and Community Building in Asia." So we'll be learning from the experiences uh, of various speakers in the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, India, as well as uh, here in Hong Kong. Our five speakers are farmer educationists or academics engaged in rural community building. We will be definitely enlightened uh, with their insights and also philosophical references in the practical work of permaculture or rural community building. We will also see how their faith or cultural heritage shape their work. Um, their spiritual you know, um, background being Buddhism, Islam, or even Gandhism, or even indigenous wisdoms. So I'm sure the concept of permaculture is not unfamiliar with the panelists and the speakers and the audience here. Um, I mean, the whole idea of permaculture you know, uh, was with the hope of achieving a more sustainable future. But it's also born out of the, you know, uh, response uh, towards emerging and obvious problems of, um, you know, abusive farming practices or, you know, hyper-consumerism. So, I mean, today, finally, the governments and peoples around the world have finally awakened to the destructions of the rampant industrial or capitalist production and consumerism, uh, mostly caused by us humans. So I'm sure you know today's panel would also help uh, all of us to gain more insights uh, through the practices and reflections of our five great speakers here. And uh, we would definitely be enriched by you know their philosophies. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce our five uh, speakers today. Um, I'll start with uh, John. John Jandai um, is a former farmer, secondly, secondly, a widely known earthen builder in Thailand. He's from Yasothorn province, Thailand, and has been farming all of his life. He also began building earthen homes on his family farm in 1997. He began doing workshops on urban building in 2002, initially traveling the country and voluntarily teaching farmers and villager groups, NGOs, etc., creating what is now a widespread urban building movement in Thailand. He co founded Pun Pun Farm in 2003 and is most interested in preserving Thai heritage in seeds. Our second speaker is Iskanda. Wawuruntu, forgive me if I have pronounced your surname wrongly, is the founder of the Bumi Language Institute Indonesia. 
Iskandar embraced Islam in 2000 and moved to Yogyakarta to start Bumi Langit at the end of 2006. He's working with Islamic faith to incorporate sustainability with forgiveness. He hopes to incorporate these two ideas with each other, linking sustainability as a form of purification. Our third speaker, Pallavi Rama Patil, has taught at Azim Premji University, Bangalore, India, from 2012 to 13, uh, 23, sorry, to students of masters in development, masters in education, masters in public policy, and to undergraduates. There were three focus areas in my teaching. One was Gandhi's vision of a uh, good society. Second was Gandhian education, in which she also led a practice-based project around mill millet farming in an urban school. And third was living utopias, curated stories and examples of alternatives to industrialism currently in practice around the world. She has recently joined the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, which is at TREE, A-T-R-E-E, -E, India, where her mandate is to design short courses for various actors in the broad area of sustainability practice and education. Our fourth speaker, Annalisa Aban or Angain, currently serves as a serious uh, senior, sorry, senior research uh, uh, associate of UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies Program on Alternative Development. Prior to that, she headed the Secretariat team of the ASEAN Civil Society Conference or ASEAN People's Forum 2017, a regional platform of civil society groups that engages issues on ASEAN. Her involvement in Southeast Asian issues began in 2002 during the Southeast Asian People's Festival in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. She finished a Master of Community Development degree from the University of the Philippines, Dilema. She has lived and worked with Metro Manila urban poor communities as well as indigenous peoples in Mindanao, where she practiced participatory development planning and action research. And our fifth and final speaker is closer to home here. Chao Si Chung is a farmer and co-founding member of Sunwood Born Organic Farm and Sunwood Kids Club in Hong Kong, which serve the local community by producing seasonal vegetables, two crops of rice annually, and facilitating gardening act activities and education for young citizen kids. He received his PhD in culture studies from Lingnan University. His research interests includes the history of food and agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and etc. He recently published a book about market gardening in Hong Kong. So I'll briefly explain uh, the rundown uh, from now on. Uh, each of our speakers will be given around 15, 20 minutes presentation uh, to describe briefly the work, the, the history of their organization and the work. Uh, they're involved in and um, and uh, share with us the guiding principles and philosophies that inform the direction of their work and uh, how these are further informed by their own religious or cultural heritage. And uh, I suppose, you know, during this process uh, and practice, how it also inform each other. And after uh, all the presentations, uh, we will have a round where each speaker uh, response uh, to give response to each other or questions to each other or you know from the floor so the floor will be open after that so we welcome questions uh, anyone who wants to um, post, a, post a question either on chat on the chat room or raise their hand I mean of course the icon and then uh, the last uh, part of the panel we will have uh, some wrap up or some concluding remarks from each speaker. So we also uh, thank today's interpreters in English, Yu Fu Tonghua, uh, Wang Xiaomei, and also uh, Dong Han Yu. Thank you very much for your very you know stressful work. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, uh, should we start uh, with the first speaker? I guess we just follow. Um, you know the names and the the uh, images on on the poster. So uh, could John uh, please start first? 
My name is John Chan Dai from Pan Pan uh, Seed Saving Center and Sustainable Learning Center. So uh, we are based in Chiang Mai, Thailand. We start our communities, our centers about 20 years ago. Before that, I uh, we did a lot of building. We did art, art and building. We are the first group who start art and building in Thailand because we we don't have this tradition in in the past. We do build a lot of wood or something like that. But later on, building to have a house is become a problem for most of people because house so expensive. But when I come across, I came across with the urgent building, I think it must be something that helped to relieve the suffering of people. So we start to do urgent building about almost 30 years ago. And we discover that urgent building is so easy. And then you don't need to have a lot of skill. You don't need a lot of money. It depends on how much you want to pay for the house. So it's the kind of choice for people who want to have a choice, cheap and easy and comfortable house. So we have been building for almost 30 years so far, but I travel all over the country seriously for five years to do urgent building. But later on, I thought the knowledge of building the the technique how to build is so simple and easy. People can learn anywhere. You can discover it anytime. But the most important thing, the most urgent thing that I need to do is to do seed saving. Because I think the seeds disappear from the world every day and never come back again. I feel very sad when I think about many kind of plants, many kind of watermelon, vegetable that I used to eat when I was a kid. And now all of them is gone. And then when you look at the market now, you can see so many things in the market. But all of them are the same. There are not many varieties. There are a lot of meat. There are a lot of pork in the market, but all the pork is come from one variety, it's come from one company. So all chicken is only one variety of chicken in the whole country. So I think this is the most serious thing to think about because we eat less and less and less variety, but we eat a big amount. Most of the food that we eat, they develop them to grow fast, high yield and fast, but not enough nutrition. Because they grow so fast, not enough time to accumulate the nutrition. And then in the same time, it's full of hormone, chemical, and things like that. So people work hard to make money to buy very bad food to eat. So I think this is not stable. This is not secure for our next generation, for our life too. Because we need good food. We need diversity of food to be able to have a good health and survive. But we have less and less choice in our life. So we de decide to stop travel to do building workshop. So we think about to have a piece of land to start seed saving center. So we got a piece of land in Chiang Mai and we started 20 years ago. So we, in the beginning, we think about maybe only a few people live together and grow vegetable and eat what we grow and saving seed and give seed to people. That's the original idea. But when we start the place, many people came to visit us and many of them don't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. They keep staying long, long time after that. So it become unintentional communities after that. We have more than 10 people from the first month, from the beginning. Until now, we try to limit number of people, not more than 20 people who stay permanently. So the main thing that we are doing uh, at the farm is to do seed saving. And then the second thing is we become a learning center for uh, a learning center is 
it's for us to learn, not for people from outside to learn. Because most of people who uh, came to stay with us in the beginning, most of them are city people or people who used to work in the city before, but they get tired of working in the city, in the system. They're looking for a new way of life. How can they feel relaxed? How can they feel enjoy their life more? That's why they're looking for some place to experiment. So when we turn to a learning center, it's for us to learn. Learn, the main thing is learn to be self-reliant. We need to rely on ourselves at least in the four basic needs, like food, shelter, daily needs, and healing or medicine. I think this four thing is basic thing for every life on this earth. But when we develop, we disconnect ourselves from the wisdom, um, from the knowledge in the four basic needs. So we feel insecure after that because when we cannot rely on our basic needs, we feel insecure. We need to work hard to make money. But we don't know how much money will make, feel, make we feel secure. We keep working and working until we die. So the idea of learning center at Pan Pan is just, we try to learn how to grow our food, how to cook food. Food has to be something simple and easy for everybody because we grew up in the most fertile world. We are in the most fertile country in the world. But how can we hungry in the middle of food? Food is everywhere. But a lot of people don't have anything to eat. That means we have some mental crisis, some thinking crisis in our head. So we try to learn how to grow, how to produce our food, how to save seed, how to be independent on food. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, how can we don't have a place to live? How can we don't have a house? Even we have land. Many people have land, but they don't have a house because the house is too expensive. In the past, people can build houses easily. Even they have no money. They just invite friends, come to help a few weeks, and then they finish the whole house. But now we feel like we so developed, we know so much, we finished university, we have a lot of things, we know a lot, but we don't have ability to build a house. It is a shame. How can we decrease our ability this much? So we try to learn how to build a simple house. So we did a lot of earthen building, built our shelter with earth. We do straw bell house, adobe house, sandbags, and bamboo house. We did many things. We try to find what is the easiest for people in each place. So house will not be a problem for people anymore if we have this skill. It doesn't take long time to learn. And then we learn a lot how to make what we use in our daily life. Make soap, make shampoo, make detergent, make sauce, make everything that we use. Because we work very hard to buy a bottle of shampoo. It's very expensive, but the cost of shampoo is very cheap. But mainly we pay for the packaging, for the bottle. We pay for the advertisement. Very expensive bottle, but when we use it, we don't keep the bottle. We just use the shampoo. So when we spend only uh, maybe $5, $10 to make our own shampoo. We have enough shampoo for the whole family for the whole year or two years without buying expensive bottles. So something like this, it helped us to see that we can design our life to make our life simple, easy, and comfortable in different way. So we learn a lot how to make things that we can use ourselves, including app appropriate technology. We learn how to do water heater system from the sunlight. We learn how to uh, do water filter 
uh, water heater, water filter, so we can filter water from our pond to drink. Why we have to buy water to drink? The world full of water, and mainly we buy bottle of water because the cost of water less than the cost of the bottle. Why we have to keep doing that? So when we learn how to do filter system, we can drink water from everywhere. We can filter it ourselves easily. And then after that, we learn how to do self-healing. Some basic thing we can help ourselves. We don't need to go see doctor for everything. Some simple thing like we have some stomach ache, some small cut, some pain, something like that. We learn how to do massage. We learn how to use herbs. We learn how to use uh, many kind of local technique that help us a lot. So when we have the skill on this four basic need, it helps us to feel freedom. We depend on ourselves quite a lot. We did not depend on the main system too much. So this is help us to feel independent more. And this is our learning center. Now in our, at our farm, we have a lot of courses and we have volunteer, we have things for people come and learn to develop their skill. So when they go back home, they can help themselves more in the basic thing. So it doesn't mean we refuse technology, we refuse money. We do not refuse anything. We use everything, but we use everything with mindfulness. If it's important, if it's necessary, if it's important, we use everything, including conventional medicine, uh, conventional healing. If it's more than our ability can deal with it, we can go to conventional medicine too. So we are a small, we are a small communities, but we learn how to be self-reliant a lot. And we practice in this way about 20 years. And now more and more people from outside want to come and learn from us. So we have a lot of workshop in the past, but now we still have workshop. Today, we still have workshop. So a lot of people want to come and learn more and more. And now we talk about the design it's like a permaculture, but in Thailand, we don't want to use the word permaculture because when we have so many techniques that's similar to permaculture and people use to the Thai term more than the permaculture term, because when we are the first group who organize permaculture course in Thailand, we discover that mostly when we say permaculture, only foreigner come and Thai people don't want to come because they don't like to sit and listen for 70 hours. So when we do the Thai style, more people come because they have some sample, they have many things to understand easily because they can see the concrete thing too. So now mainly we just do a lot of training to show people how can we decide our piece of land and we can live on that land. When we want to retire, we can live on that land happily. We have income from the land. We can have food. We have everything from our land. So we decide to have corn, to have garden, to have fruit, something like that. Yeah. So uh, I think this, this training spreading all over the country. And then we have we networking with another group who do the same training. So we did a lot of training every year. Now we've, this year only our network can grow, can plant the trees, more than 1 million trees this year, all over the country. So we plan to grow more tree, encourage people to design their land, to stop doing monocrop and then start to do uh, the design to grow diversity. Mainly in the, the, the training, we train people to grow for themselves first. We are the farmer. We are the people who grow food. We need to have good food to eat first. So the first thing we need to grow for ourselves, leftover from ourselves, we can sell, we can share, we can give to other people. If we don't have enough to eat, we cannot grow for sale. 
because in the past, we grow monocrop for sale. We grow corn, but we never eat corn. We grow sugar cane, but we don't eat sugar cane. But we sell it very cheap with small amount of money. We use that money to buy very bad food to eat, to feed the family. I feel like that. this is very wrong because we hurt ourselves. We hurt the nature. We hurt the world. We hurt everything for nothing. So but when we grow for ourselves, we stop using all kinds of chemical because we, we eat it ourselves. And then we grow many varieties because we don't eat the same thing over and over. So when we grow many variety and stop using chemical, it helps our ecosystem grow back again, come back again. So it starts to create the communities. It helps our community to connect together more and more. Because when we finish the training, we do the same thing. We will have one thing, one tradition that we used to have in the past, but after we become uh, capitalized, we stop using it. Now we bring it back. We call it joint force party. Like many people come together and help each other. They bring their own food to help. Like if I want to plant uh, 10,000 trees at my land today, I just send a message to people. And maybe 20 people, 100 people come to my land and they come with their food, with their tools. They come and help to plant everything, cook together, eat together. And then if you have time, we can share experience and something like that. It's very fun. It become new communities. It make people who live in the city, but don't have land. They have a chance to come and plant and use their labor and they feel happy to have more friends. So I feel like uh, we need to develop this way of life more because it helped us to, it helped to empower ourselves more. Before that, we feel weak, we feel low, we feel poor. But now we don't care about those things anymore because we have many friends. We have many people come together. We have power. So in the same time, we have more food, more trees. The soil will be better and better. So this is what we are doing in Thailand now. So this year is about 21 years for us at Pan Pan. We keep working in the same way. And in, in the future, we, we don't know what will happen. We don't mind, we don't care much, but we keep doing. We try to make today the best that's what we can do. So we did not think much about the future. So that's for me now. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I think you already set uh, the stage you know, for you know, a lot of food for thought. Definitely, what you have been doing, what you have been seeing as the problems that you know we in urban areas face, and then you actually found solutions, and then and then from there you yeah you build up a very strong community where and and you know sort of uh, have a lot of reflection and uh, draw wisdom, which would also help these urbanites to bring back home. So I'm sure you know we will have you know a lot. To discuss later on uh, and if anyone has got questions please you know feel free to uh, put your questions on the chat uh, or wait for a bit and to voice out your questions so um thanks john again uh, we will now move on to the second speaker iskander uh while we'll run to uh, iskander please greeting of peace assalamu alaikum to all and uh, thank you for inviting me to be in this uh, beautiful gathering meeting of uh, knowing new people, making new friends. Uh, so where do I start? You know, I think John has uh, described a very, very perfect and uh, rightful life style that we all have to copy, obviously. But um, um, I want to uh, sort of look at the problem more of uh, sort of degrading quality on spiritualism, not only in Islam, but sort of in broad sense happen to all religion because uh, uh, the issue of uh, what we really have a problem with is the issue of uh, is ethic, 
is how do we live our everyday life? And um, this is what made me uh, uh, sort of very, very strongly keen on, on looking at the way to remind um, uh, us each other as a human and also me to other Muslim on the importance of ethics uh, and morals in our everyday life. And I think we can really see it easily that is the base of our problem, how basically our relationship with nature and our relationship to each other as, as human has become more based on exploitation, based on taking rather than giving. And, uh, and uh, I'm not really an expert on, I'm not a scholar in Islam. I'm not scholar in also in, 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 in agriculture or in sociology, but I've become very much a practitioner. Uh, sort of, um, I started my, my, my sort of farming job, even now I was farming before that already, also around the same time as John, around 20 years ago. So my interest is actually try to sort of uh, open uh, the discussion about uh, how to, 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 to design a good life, how, through practice, obviously, and it's all started as a practice on how we have to recover a lot of, of the problematic issue of our life on ethical aspect of life. One thing in Islam, which is actually I use a lot to remind myself and remind other Muslim, there is a beautiful guidance regarding the relationship with nature and, and, and other human, which is actually we never really heard a lot of. We often heard the term of halal and haram uh, that we become very, very uh, sort of uh, uh, no, no very hurt a lot of. But every time the word halal mentioned, it's also there is another word that attached to it that never really become emphasis on, which is toyib. Toyib means wholesome or goodness, and 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 so everything everything to become truly halal is also has to be wholesome. And to be wholesome, it's very important to have the right intention since the very beginning that you are involved on making it or producing it. Uh, and, and this is again, uh, the wisdom that we used to have. We inherited from our past, from our parents, from their parents on how that only good things actually goes from one generation to another generation as part of knowledge, as part of wisdom. And obviously, you know, in the last, you know, depend where you are, but let's say in the last hundred years, we've been cut off from this uh, tradition of, of, of inheriting wisdom. We all depend on living with, 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 uh, with industry as everything that provides our needs in life. And obviously it's become problematic because if it's the right mode, if it's the right way to do it, we all already become much better as humankind right now in this earth. But we are on the opposite side, you know, our quality of life, our physical health, our mental health, emotional health, our social health, even our religious health, is also is all going down the drain. And that shows that basically we are not consuming. We not, I wouldn't even use the consume. We not, we don't have the right intake in our, our life that are in our world today, we, we call it sustainable. In the old term, we call, we call it blessing or baroka. So it's something that actually uh, bless it, blessful is, is something that sustain. So, you know, again, I'm just, what I'm trying to do is trying to remind myself and remind most of the people who come to our center about this issue, about the food you eat, uh, because obviously the most re important relationship that you have in life is to your own body. Everything started with your own body because uh, your body is actually, it's also has a right in itself. Uh, what we do now is we neglect all the right of, of, of nature uh, and, 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 and it's become more of the right of, uh, of individual in the wrong way that being promoted to, 
to become the, the ruler or the leader of, of, of how we lead our life. Um, so, you know, in a way, in my experience, I have a very hard time trying to pass the, this message, message to, 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 let's say, local villager, you know, I mean, uh, uh, because they are so tied up into, um, into the sort of, um, I wouldn't say modern, but the, the consumeristic lifestyle, even on their practice of agriculture. They depend on my, so much uh, because of the green revolution that has uh, wiped up the whole generation of the old wisdom because the people who are farmers now has reached around maybe say let's 60 years old. They all are the new generation farmers that being conditioned by all the chemical and, 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 and uh, uh, chemical farming. So it's very hard to to, to, to remind them about this aspect of, 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 uh, of injustice, let's say, uh, towards life. Um, but again, because I'm talking in the perspective of spiritualism, especially because I'm a Muslim, I can remind them about these consequences. If you, if you are a good Muslim, so does if you good in any other religion, there will be a consequences, ethical consequences that has to be applied in life. And then that's where, where I go in and say, how do you farm the Islamic way? Or if you are a Buddhist or if you're a Christian, you say, how do you farm the, the, the Buddhist way? You know, because it's, it's most of the practice of farming or producing food nowadays when you go back to the principle of your religion, it doesn't go together because it's almost in contrary to the guidance of, of, of life because it's not sustainable. It's not, it's, there is no blessing in it. Uh, so it's become an interesting sort of a, a journey because, you know, again, I'm become more, more, more or less alone in the, uh, on the, uh, separated from the common sort of society, even in my religious community, because they're so caught up with this consumerism and the industry has become completely dominance on the provider of everything they use. So my challenge is more on how to, how to awaken uh, uh, the, the, the fact there is a very principle um, understanding that if it's been seen in the right way, it can trigger them to change their their heart set, you know. And then, 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 then a lot of things can be done, you know. I mean, like John said, most of the things that have become uh, 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 a tool of of our life, it's so simple, and it's 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 there because when you give to nature, and when you give to other human they will give it back to you. It, it will make things simple, you know, and, and obviously, you know, it's, there is, should be a point where it's, it's become a matter of necessary to look at it that way, because most people doesn't even look at it that way. They think life is, is, is okay. You know, there is nothing wrong of being a perfect consumer. There is nothing wrong with being depend on industry. I mean, this is, I mean, if you talk about, uh, I think maybe 90% of people uh, uh, in the urban setup find it it's 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 okay, you know. So so we 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 have to somehow go in and change that, and and that's where we, where our center become interesting because like John, we have a kind of a center that actively uh, accommodate young people to to come in and visit permaculture, uh, our permaculture center. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, go through, through sort of a different type of lifestyle where they are exposed to a different energy, different understanding, different trace of food. Uh, and and, and I, I see the, the very great impact that it has happened to them. And, um, and, and, and I would have to, you know, I feel sometimes sorry and sad that the fact that the main uh, group of, let's say, conventional uh, sort of student of Islam from, from formal 
sort of community, they're not too much interested. So we basically are more involved on, on people who are trying to find a new meaning of life. And, and some of them are Muslim and some of them are not. It's not, a, it's not a problem for us because the fact that this is the diversity that can reach, enrich us, uh, 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 each other on the fact that everybody has a truth, has a wisdom that they can share based on their background from all different faith and all, all different background. And permaculture has become very much the, the, the sort of the platform that we can share that. So, you know, basically that's, uh, that's uh, you know, so much to, uh, to share out, out of my experience of these 20 years, but, you know, uh, we we'll start with that. And obviously we can sort of further discussion with uh, uh, later with, uh, with the input of others. So I end it now and um, I would really love to hear sort of the experience and the opinion of the other participant uh, today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Iskandar. Uh, definitely, you know, I, I think what you really put on the table is how to, you know, uh, to, um, yeah, how to assert the Islamic faith and uh, in, you know, the practices of permaculture and, of course, the success that, you know, your institute has been doing and that all, how that also informs, you know, and renews, you know, the Islamic faith in the in the different practices i also see you know on your website you know you have such you know um network of uh operation like right? working with universities setting up trust you know your trust foundation uh you provide courses and training you know you've definitely you know um uh, um exhausted a lot of different channels in reaching out right and spread the message to the young to the old to the urban you know citizens uh, so I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of questions that, you know, uh, we would like to ask and to learn from you, from your example. So thanks a lot once again to Iskanda. Um, may I uh, welcome the third speaker, Palavi Varma Patil um, from India, uh, so that we can learn from, uh, you know, our experiences also in the context of India. Uh, Palavi, please. Thank you, Lisa. And I... May I just say to John and Iskandar that I'm so humble that you both spoke before me. And I'm just wondering why did Kinchi invite me to this panel? Because both of you have spoken so well and you say trigger the heart. I, I really feel like, yeah, I don't know what I have to say uh, in the gathering of such people, but uh, it's, it's a really good formulation. I have been struggling with uh, hope, frankly. And uh, one of the reasons why I accepted Kinchi's uh, invite was because I ran an urban uh, farming project in a school space with young children. And uh, it was a farming project because I have been grappling with uh, Gandhi's idea of a good society. And what does it mean to be a good individual in that good society? Are these ideas relevant? Are, are children going to grapple with these ideas as I as an adult grapple with it? And how do I do it? I'm also not a scholar. I'm from practice. Uh, I love uh, and enjoy uh, doing things and reflecting upon them. And so today when I'm coming and presenting this, I'm feeling a bit shy <laughs> because you have like 20 years of wisdom and I'm going to talk about just a two year old project which is also going through its uh, uh, stages. And, uh, but the three things that uh, Gandhi's um, ideas of education taught me were head, hand and heart. And the fourth thing that I want to add to it is hope because the fourth edge that I discovered during this project was all around hope. So I'm going to just share some pictures to so have an idea of where I stay, where I did my project and why uh, I stay in one part of Bangalore, which is uh, peri-urban. It's neither urban, not rural, but Bangalore is going through a steady transformation and a very fast one. So cities is absolutely gobbling all its agriculture lands. And there is very little you know, initiative in pushing back the city. And in fact, the farm that uh, the children farmed on and they farmed a millet, 
uh, that land is already now sold off and it's uh, a huge building has come up. And that's why I say I grappled with hope because of these ideas. So I'm just, just bear with me. I have some pictures to show. I'm not like yeah. going around. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I call my project the Ragi project because Ragi is the local name for the millet here in Karnataka. And um, if you can see, uh, we designed the logo with some thought. We thought, okay, from the green to the harvesting stage, uh, we are part of a circle of life. And uh, we wanted to uh, reflect that idea in the work that we did. Um, this is how Ragi looks like. Uh, I'm sure you know it as finger millet and by its scientific name, uh, but it's because it has looks like fingers. <laughs> so it's fun. Uh, the kids really like it that it came out like this. It looks like a hand. Uh, we had three spaces where we grew. Uh, the last picture that you see, this agriculture land is uh, now uh, land that has been sold to a building, but it was the land belonging to a school staff. Um, there are small balconies in the school where we grew food and there is a schoolyard. And just like John said, uh, we also did not initially call it permaculture. I mean, there were a lot of teachers who had ecological agriculture knowledge. And uh, we just went with, okay, what did your dad do? Or what did you do when you were a child? And we just went with that knowledge. And um, then somebody told us, oh, you know, you should call a permaculturalist to train you. And then all the ideas, we started putting it up. So we actually, um, put up a poster in the school saying, what is permaculture and to explain to children. Uh, but we tried all techniques that were useful to give us a better yield without putting in. And the thing with millets, ragi, is that you do not need too much of care. So it was an easy crop to choose. Um, so uh, what did we do in these two years? I'm just going to not talk too much about it, but because at that time I was a university professor and I was uh, very keen on seeing if Gandhian education can be applied. So here are children uh, making compost in school. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to see if hands-on activities can be combined with middle school education. That was the crux of Gandhi's test. It was the test that can you do uh, activity and um, academic, academic concepts together um, that would really transform the school. So that's what I went to do. So we did like um, drip irrigation, we mulched, uh, we had uh, all sorts of transplanting techniques. Uh, we had trellis. Uh, these were uh, saris donated by parents, so we formed uh, boundaries. There was a lot of community thing. There was soil testing being done uh, just to see if, how, how much have we enhanced the nutrition of the soil. And then we decided that we must learn geography through the farm. So here was the map. Uh, here was an entomologist who had visited us and she taught us what insects can we see on the farm. And then we learned botany just by observing the lentils growing on the farm. Uh, we had some maths, children learned fractions. We did a lot of cooking and then we learned fractions through it. And there was a clever maths teacher who designed good worksheets. And so, you know, um, a very interesting combination was happening in middle school curriculum around a hands-on activity. Um, uh, we had surveys because uh, class four in India does data measurement and we thought let's do data measurement through an actual survey and uh, we decided if you can see question five which is your favorite ragi dish a lot of kids do not like the finger millet because it's tasteless but it's also very nutritious it's also a peasant food so it has a uh, uh, politics of food around it. It is also the underdog. So, you know, all things are going against Ragi. So, so making it um, come inside school curriculum was also my own uh, political agenda. I really wanted it to uh, be highlighted. Um, so yes, here is some data analysis. So class five is doing it. Um, but the purpose of this talk, you know, when Kinchi told me, can you come and talk? I uh, I thought about a few things and here is what I wanted to say. This is a picture I took at one of the school events. Uh, they are using the ragi flour to make uh, a sweet dish called the laddus. And uh, it's usually traditionally made in India. We make these sweets and keep them uh, stacked. Most mothers would make it. And of course it's dying and now we can buy uh, sweet snacks from the market. 
Uh, but the act of making is cumbersome. It uh, requires patience. It requires a lot of hands. And at some point when I took this picture, I, I sort of stopped and reflected because of all the wonderful goals that my project was achieving. I thought this is, this is one of the goals. I mean, the, here are like a group of people coming together. We are celebrating comradeship. We are celebrating labor. We are ce celebrating the coming together of things. So um, I decided that I will now start photographing where are the spaces where our bodies are coming together, where we have a sense of connection with the land and with ourselves. And at that same time, uh, one of my mentors who I work very closely with gifted me uh, a small uh, book by a Gandhian activist. I don't know if you can see the book. Um, I got it along. It's called Anuband. I don't think you can see it. No. Okay. Um, but the book had a small poem and the poem went like this. I'm not alone in the world. You're bound to me and I'm to you. I'm also bound to the people in my community and we are linked to each neighboring community. Together we form the world like oceanic circles or the rooting branches of the great banyan tree. We are all bound to each other and to the land. Therefore, the sweetness you pour into our relationship will nourish my life, just as the bitterness I spill will harm your life. We are under one sky, we breathe a common air, we draw water from a common ground, we eat the same produce, we're all children of Mother Earth. This give and take ties us together in a net of mutuality. This is called Anuband. Let us acknowledge this bond between us because the world is sustained by the sum of all our correlated actions. This uh, peace activist, a Gandhian activist has uh, now passed away, but uh, I met her and I told her about this project and I told her I use your poem very much in the project as well. And uh, she told me that Anuband comes from a word in Sanskrit, um, which is literally connections between each other. And uh, she found it in the Gita, in the Hindu text Gita. And uh, since then, I have printed this poem. I've put it in staff rooms. I have gifted them on WhatsApp messages. And the teachers and the children um, have used this poem, illustrated it, and it was part of the school community. It, it just sort of felt that there was, there was an articulation of the feeling, the, the edge of the heart that we were feeling when we were part of this project. Uh, and so, as I said, I started photographing a lot of spaces where we were coming together, of course, in cooking, in food processing, uh, harvesting, and even, you know, weeding or transplanting or tending to the farm, uh, in, in preparing the soil. I mean, you can see all of us in there uh, with children and teachers. Um, you can see threshing, this is school terrace, they're threshing it with their feet, the teacher helping, hierarchies being dissolved. So this was a really big uh, moment for me and I wanted to highlight it in this talk that this idea of Anuban was the first thing that I felt uh, was one of the things of Gandhian education that worked for me. Um, and you can see, you know, like joyous faces during the harvest coming together. Then I got gifted this uh, uh, song. I don't know if you recognize, uh, this is by Pete Seeger. Uh, it says the world will be solved by millions of small things. Um, and every time we were very uh, doubtful whether our little, you know, insignificant sort of an effort of growing millets in an urban school farm on a land which will be gobbled anyway, uh, uh, is it going to make any sense? And every time there was a doubt, I have this postcard as a fridge magnet on my fridge. And I feel like, oh, you know, I mean, millions of small things. But then I thought, you know, um, this should correspond with another one of Rabindranath Tagore's saying, and that goes like this. It's in Bengali. It says, Tomar opor ne bhubanor bhar, which means the world's burdens are not on your shoulders. Uh, a lot of times I've been part of this NGO sector for a very long time. And I feel like a lot of times we have the savior complex. We feel like, oh, we are going to solve the world. And I think that um, in community-based projects, uh, it's very important to pull back and feel that, you know, I alone can't solve it. It has to be part of so many of us. And 
it's not possible for me alone. I mean, we, we have to have uh, different approaches and we have to respect those different approaches. And so this, this was really one of the guiding principles midway through the project. Um, just to tell you, um, uh, this is uh, Vasanta, she is doing this uh, harvesting. And a lot of people used to say, oh, you're romanticizing agriculture. You're going back to traditional ideas. And this is all good as a, as a school project, but it's not going to really make a difference. And, uh, you know, she put out this quote and she says, it's, it, we really, I really felt that it was not one teacher effort. It was like a community. Uh, so much of discussion, so much of belief in this work. And uh, we didn't have to succeed. We just have to come together to do something. And talking of success, um, I just want to say, this is me standing with a scarecrow. And I just wanted to say that one of the learnings that I learned, which I'm sure is Kandar and John and others hanging as well, you already know it, but you know we were so enthusiastic and we were urban farmers, we were no wise, we had technical know-how. And yet we sowed at the wrong time, we harvested at the wrong time, we put up the scarecrow at the wrong time. I mean, there was so much going wrong with us and at some point we had to um, submit to the laws of nature <laughs> and we had to learn to recognize when the rains come, what should we do? Uh, we had to hope that the ragi will sprout because we had done what we could and it was all going wrong. We finally did manage to get some produce and we were very happy, but then at some point we had to, we had to wait, we had to slow down with our enthusiasm. And um, there is a very lovely Kabir saying, Kabir is uh, one of our philosopher poets in India. And uh, we learn this saying in school textbooks and we mug it up and produce it in exams. But I really thought about that saying and the saying, saying goes, uh, slow down dear heart, because everything happens at its own time. However much you put in water at your land, um, the fruit comes only when there is a season. So uh, that saying is so beautiful in, in Hindi. And I thought that uh, we had to remind ourselves that, you know, slow down. I mean, we, we have to be in tune with, the, with nature. Uh, my last uh, reflection on this, uh, the second last one is that uh, if you can see here is a mango tree. Um, uh, we got some... On the, in the second year, we got some land, which is on private property uh, opposite the school. It was easier for us to commute to the land and tend to it, and we decided to take it on. Unfortunately, it was a gated community. Bangalore is now known for its gated communities. Much of its agriculture land is now being divided and people build houses. Um, this is a mango tree, and one of the kids asked me if he could pluck a mango. And this mango tree is not our property. It was the neighbor's property. And I said, yes. Uh, I didn't realize that these are kids. And when you say yes to mango, I mean, they just, uh, they started competing with each other. They, they wanted more mangoes. And it, it, was, it was a bit of a mayhem. And um, a lot of people, um, a lot of teachers were very upset with me. And if you can see, this is how the farm is. If you can see, there is a... Um, there are buildings around and I had to tender in an apology. I was just coming back from the forests in Orissa where uh, indigenous groups uh, use common land. And in my head, this private common is all muddled. And I was a bit upset that we had to make rules for private property. Uh, in Gandhi's uh, commons understanding, uh, the commons are for everyone, but in urban Bangalore, it's clearly not the case. My last learning is that we very late learned from this, there's an individual standing there, he's a farmer. He told us that when you harvest, leave some harvest for the birds, for the rabbits, for the, um, <laughs> for the squirrels, for the mice, and just don't be greedy and take it all on your own. And um, he was showing us here that how much the birds have eaten. So leave it, don't, don't grab everything on your own. And I wanted to say that that was one of the rules of, uh, you know, this individualistic desire in urban farmers, we produce, we should consume, that got broken. And in much of Gandhian literature, there is a writing that says that who is a teacher? Uh, is it the one who has all the certificates or is it the one who has all the skills and the right, right attitude? And so that came back to me. Here is the last quote. 
Um, here is uh, in 1954 when Gandhian schools were in their heyday, um, a lot of experiments on growing food in schools were carried out. In one of the teacher training conferences, this is the president who wrote saying, um, no one has claimed that this is an easy idea. It is very um, stressful for teachers, but in one place the teacher finds reassurance and that's the response of children. And it was true in my case as well. And that's why while has come back because the project has gone through its ups and downs. And I always remember that the kids were so happy and so enthused when we were doing these projects. And that is the fourth edge of Gandhian education that I wanted to highlight in this presentation of mine. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Malavi. Your, your speech is very, very spiritual itself. <laughs> You so well articulated, you know, um, something which is obviously, you know, fruit of years of your, you know, commitment and time, I mean, thankless task on what you were doing. And definitely shows, you know, how you believed in, you know, what you're doing. And I think, you know, you have really pointed out, you know, the, some of the essence that, you know, I've been also thinking now, you know, how we as human beings, you know, could respond to, you know, um, a, a, a juncture where, you know, there seems to be, you know, futureless futures, right? And, uh, you know, things that are, you know, caused by, of course, you know, um, uh, power asymmetry, injustices and inequalities, but also a growing, you know, um, realization that a lot of things we have done to this earth, you know, have been done by us by, as human beings. And I think, you know, what you have been saying just now is, is you know, some part of us is, is, I mean, lifelong education is about humbling ourselves, right? And of course, who is most more humble than Gandhi, right? And I'm so happy to see how, you know, uh, some of the some of Gandhi's thoughts uh, and philosophies actually have been, you know, renewed and you know, uh, lived, you know, uh, for all these years, you know, through efforts like yours. And um, I'm sure a lot of people will have, you know, similar insights and questions for for you, Palavi. Uh, but I think we can also move on uh, to. Our fourth speaker, um, Ananisa Aban, uh, who's bringing in uh, um, experiences uh, from the Philippines. So, um, Ananisa, please. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks everyone for for this invitation. This is so um, well. Uh, this is a welcome um, opportunity for everyone. Uh, I stand as, here as a scholar activist. Uh, I used to be part of the social movement, especially on food sovereignty and uh, indigenous people's rights. But this time, since uh, 2018, I was part already of the University of the Philippines as a researcher. So it's a good opportunity as well to share to everyone what has been going on among grassroots communities doing alternative practices in Southeast Asia. And uh, yeah, on a personal level, um, these uh, cases that I would like to present uh, are somehow inspiring to to us, no, especially these peasant unions, and even to myself uh, as I reflect continually, especially on my experience with the uh, Talandig indigenous communities of the Philippines. But please bear with me because my presentation would be more kind of scholarly and some some kind of radical insights because I would be talking about land occupation movements of uh, communities, of farming communities, and how it is related to their sustainable practices, which we rather term it as agroecology. So allow me now for a screen share. So this is my presentation. It's about the peasant land occupation movements and agroecology in Southeast Asia. And this is part of our research uh, within the program on alternative development of the Center for Integrative and Development Studies of the University of the Philippines. So first case that I would like to share is the case of the peasants in Timor-Leste. 
So to give you a very brief uh, historical background of Timor, so it's predominantly agricultural or rural, no? So the, rur the rural practices, sorry, I cannot see it. Wait. The so it, it's the rural practices that are intricately embedded within uh, the natural surroundings of the communities have been periodically disrupted during the Portuguese colonization and subsequent Indonesian occupation. So for some of you, you, you must have been familiar about the issue about the pre-East Timor movement before. Uh, historically, it has been occupied by Portuguese and and subsequently um, occupied by the Indonesian military, you know, and that was only in 1999 when it had its independence. So during these periods of unrest, people were denied or to some extent discouraged to express their ritual life, initiate their own traditional resource management and conservation efforts, as well as maintain social cohesion. However, they survived these stages of vol volatile political landscape punctuated by multiple episodes of mobility, forcible relocation to new territories, and series of resistance underlying this dark past. The brutality of their history has not prevented them from reviving traditions with such fortitude after the independence. I'm trying to say here that Timorese rural societies have their own indigenous practices even prior to colonization of, of, of Portugal and the subsequent Indonesian occupation. And these are thri thriving within their communities. Uh, somehow it didn't, uh, it was not uh, subjugated or it was not really, it, it didn't really die down, uh, but it, it, uh, it has been resurgent uh, in post-independence uh, Timor-Leste. So the colonial history of Timor-Leste and the Hermera Peasant Union or the Union Agricultores Municipio Irmera. So this is one of the cases that we have so far documented and our research participants in partnership with the Kedadalak Sulimutuk Institute. So following the end of the Indonesian occupation in 1999, UNAIR occupied and distributed lands, also known as popular land reform. So there was really massive land occupation movements uh, under the leadership of farmers uh, in post-independence Timor-Leste. Purpose of this action is for equal land distribution that aimed to secure farmers' ownership of the land that was grabbed from them during Portuguese colonization until the Indonesian occupation. So what is the strategy of the union? First, it is to fight for popular agrarian reform or the land occupation movements that they have waged since independence um, uh, period. The second one is to promote and, de and defend their sustainable agricultural model, which is uh, they term it, uh, they accept it as also part of agroecology. But we have to remember that um, this uh, form of agroecology is somehow deep and uh, contextual, and it's not that uh, it's somehow different from the very technical description about um, what, what, how to farm, what to farm, what to plant, etc., and all these uh, processes, technical processes about uh, agriculture, no? But Agri-ecology for the peasant unions are more deep and more related to their uh, connection to the land, to, to nature. So some of the practices of Una Air, for example, is tree nursery, planting of endemic tree species to intercrop with coffee trees and maintain forest diversity, poultry raising, planting of staple food to ensure food supply and supplement the seasonal income from coffee production. Uh, we have to remember that Ermera, the municipality of Ermera, is the biggest or the largest source of coffee farming, of coffee fr production in Timor-Leste. But uh, historically, it has not been very sustainable, especially for the farming, for the farmers rather, because of uh, the issue about uh, monocropping uh, uh, and, and the, the, the impact of the uh, coffee industry, you know? of the plantation economy to farmers. So that's why they were opting to have more on agroecology uh, in their communities. And then the last would be preservation of cultural practices such as the Tarabandu. So what is the Tarabandu? Tarabandu is an reinforcement of agrarian reform and agroecology. 
post-conflict Timorese agrarian societies regenerate an ancient customary practice known as the Tarabandu to forward their land claims pending a national agrarian policy that recognizes communal land rights. Beyond the performance of an ancient ceremony lies the potential of this cultural practice and the strength of the symbol for effective community decision-making, collective action, and enforcement system. In the words of a peasant leader who is Alberto Martinez, he said that tradition may not only be good, may not always be good rather, but it may also hold possible solutions to complex community conundrums. What is this Tarabandu? So it's a system of customary law that has been practiced across uh, Timor-Leste. And it's uh, it's a pre-colonial practice, no? Uh, among especially among rural societies. Um, it it's a community application for natural resources management. So in Tetun language, Tara means hanging, while Bandu means prohibition. So if you see here a picture, it's a symbol of a prohibition, uh, or um, an oral uh, policy, no? That people re should respect and should honor. So what is the important role? The important role of the Tarabandu to the peasant union, it is to secure agrarian reform, which is the political agenda of the union and to promote sustainable agriculture. So because Tarabandu demonstrates traditional evidences to secure the community's right to land, it is the Leonine or the cultural expert who, who holds indigenous and historical wisdom to identify which part is owned by a certain clan or umalisan or a family. It is the Leonine who will fortify the union's fight for the land that belongs to the community and not to someone else. Uh, we have to re we have to also to note that uh, even in Timor Leste, the mestizo families or the elite, no, there are still the elite forces in Timorese societies who own vast tracts of land. Uh, so there is an ongoing contestations between peasant unions and uh, these mestizo elites who had who were able to claim land uh, during those uh, uh, political regimes of uh, Portuguese colonization and Indonesian occupation. So Tarabando for the Peasant Union is about sustainable agriculture that highlights the respect of people to people and respect of ecology. Sorry. So I go now to Thailand in respect to John. So this is from the south. I, I guess you're from the north, but this uh, I would like to highlight also this experience of the peasant unions in Thailand because this is very inspiring. Uh, albeit they have not been really uh, highlighted in many of the scholar discussions about the land occupation movements that they did in South Thailand. So the existence of inequitable land distribution has endured in Thailand because the Thai state has concentrated land management legitimized through legislation and forces. The capitalist model of development in Thailand has reinforced land commodi commodification to serve the capitalist market economy. So the land struggle in the South of Thailand began between 2001 and, 20, and 2002. Um, these organizations, these peasant groups were engaged in a research or land inventory in the South in partnership, I think, with the government. No? A people's organization network worked with the Thai government to analyze the encroachment of people in forest lands. So in 2003, the former group Southern Poor People Network discovered that more than 70 rai, or approximately 11,200 hectares of land concessions for oil palm plantations have already expired. So take note that these are 11,000 hectares no? who had expired permits. The, the network decided to occupy land to demand the Thai government to expropriate land from these companies and redistribute it to landless peasants and workers. So the Southern Peasants Federation of Thailand was formed, was born in 2008 to re-establish a land rights movement in Suratani province. Its members started the land occupation between 2006 to 2013. Uh, reclaiming agrarian rights from agribusiness plantations or agribusiness companies. I mean the oil palm, the oil palm companies. It has proposed an alternative land management model that demands a decentralization of land management from the state to the local people. 
SPFT pushes for collective land and natural resources management and proposed a community land title or community it has to, it, it's not individual what they're pushing is a uh, community is community ownership of land and resources instead of individualized uh, land titling which is more contingent to capitalist orientation on land management so what's the perspective of SPFT on agroecology SPFT works with nature to grow back community forests and restore the land and ecosystem that has been overused by oil palm monoculture plantations for more than 30 years. SPFT is currently building a pilot agroecology community. Although members are adjusting to agroecological production methods, they benefit from arable land and sustainable food production. I will show you some pictures later. And it also works with Wibon Kim Chalern Agroforestry Center in Cha Chung Sao province. So this is according to one of their leaders, Mr. Surapon Sungruk, no? during our panel discussion in 2021 um, conference on alternatives in Southeast Asia. So what so far, what are the challenges? So historically, it has not been, it was not very easy no? for the land occupation movement of these Thai farmers in Suratani. So there were killings, no? There were violent uh, um, incidents that happened in the area. Four community members were killed by an unidentified armed men. No perpetrators were found. Community members faced forcible eviction, arbitrary arrest and detention, destruction of properties and crops, and intimidation. There was judicial harassments that have been employed by oil palm companies to, per to prosecute community members. Farmers have been charged by oil palm companies with three criminal offenses, no? including trespass, mischief, and criminal association. So these are some of the alternative agroecological agro practices that they have been doing until now. So you have here a, a picture of the sharing of farm labor uh, across all members of, of, of SPFT. There's this check and balances mechanism, so they are very... Uh, systematic in the monitoring, especially on safety and security. To think that considering that there have been so many instances of harassment, no, and then they have to maintain uh, discipline and organized um, collective labor in farm management. So that's how they do it. And then they also have their products. So you see here naturally processed food products from organically grown crops that are basically. Um, produced in, in Suratani. So here are some of my reflections. Sorry, I need to. Land, uh, I see here, la sorry, land reform from below. So these are some of my reflections uh, in, uh, in so far as I have been documenting and doing the research about how important are these land occupation movements of peasant unions across Southeast Asia? And why is it, it turns out that why is it that uh, agroecological practices of communities have been there, you know, have been maintained? What is the connection between these land occupation movements of landless peasants and the practice of sustainable agriculture? So I have some of the, well, you, you, can, you can call it conceptual framework or theoretical analysis. So these are some of my, the things that uh, so hard for um, help me out in seeing the connection between these two elements. No? So the importance of land reform from below. Land is an important asset for the poor and landless farmers. Democratizing land access can be, can be a cornerstone for sustainable development in rural communities. Under a neoliberal political environment, the presence of strong peasant movements are critical in the land reform process. Land occupations can be thought as an illegal act as peasants transgress formal state or private law by occupying land that is not legally theirs. The mainstream development perspective antagonizes, rejects, or, illeg or illegalizes these counter-hegemonic acts of the peasant collectives. Hence, their narratives remain less visible, undervalued, and understudied. 
Due to this illegal nature, it can be expected that land occupations will be short-lived and quickly abrogated the moment the legal order is restored by state authority. Yet, no, on the contrary, we see how land occupations in different places in the world, such as the most researched and well-known uh, land occupation movement of the Bra of Brazil's land landless workers uh, movement, it is often obtained in a remarkably long-lived and sustainable character and developed in more permanent solutions. Peasant land occup occupied territories maintain resilience and level of empowerment. And in many occasions, despite the continuing state-led condemnation of their claim making and the pressures from market and capital, their, their diverse alternative practices emerge, continue to thrive, and even become outstanding in times of crisis and life-threatening emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic. In the process of land con collectivization at the stage of post-land occupation, it is interesting to discover how women's emancip emancipation is understood. Solidarity, intersectionality, and social reproduction are being framed and developed in the process. Southeast Asia has sev several cases of peasant-led land occupation movements vis-a-vis -vis agroecological practices. No? I mentioned here, for example, the Bukidnon case in the Philippines and West Java, the SPP movement in uh, Indonesia. They have been waged to reclaim their territories from decades or even centuries of dispossession as a result of coloniality, post-colonial state building, and the intrusion of corporations and global capital to the rural landscape. These were by wage with contestations and even violent tensions. So I have here some of our reflections from Rosette et, et al, which is somehow relevant and really very much related to the Southeast Asian uh, experience about agroecology, which is really beyond the technical discourse. No, it is a there's this uh, three elements that they have uh, um, summarized. No, which is very relevant to the cases. To the two cases I have just shared. No? It, this is about agriculture and ancestrality. So what emphasized here is agriculture as a heritage, as a cultural identity of Southeast Asia. The second is organization and common horizons of struggle. It is about the articulation of the culture of resistance and solidarity and the, and the strong and the critical importance of peasant movement building. The third is about praxis. Agri-ecology is a social process, a science, and a practice. Formation and dialogue of knowledge between the ancestral, vernacular, local language, and that of the technician, scientists, and academics. So that ends my presentation. Thank you. And I have here the links. I'll just email or maybe send it to the group chat. Uh, the links to the, 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 the book or the monograph that we have uh, so far published where you can see the two cases I have presented. So thank you very much. Thank you to you, Anthony, uh, of um, articulating uh, the, you know, yeah, the, the, the challenges and the struggles, you know, that, you know, are often involved, right, in, you know, such kind of context, you know, when we, you know, uh, want to, you know, sort of uh, preserve, you know, uh, sustainability. Uh, land is, uh, is often, you know, ironically become a problem, right? Where, you know, I think compared to Hong Kong, you know, uh, context of the Philippines or a lot of uh, Southeast Asian or South Asian context, you know, have more land, but then uh, of land is often, you know, sort of claimed by, you know, the governments, by, uh, you know, uh, companies, in this case, by monocultural practices, uh, it, which becomes very ironic. And I think, yeah, uh, in, the, in the Philippines, it also becomes struggle for you know indigenous, you know, uh, in, indigenous peoples, you know, claim to land. Of course, at the end of the day, of course, this is you know goes back to the you know the the crux of the issue, right? You know, who actually owns the land on the earth? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, yeah. But thanks for you know uh, sharing with us, you know the you know, the, the struggles, you know, that actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is the background of many of, you know, the contacts we are facing now. 
and I'm sure you know we will want to learn more you know about um, you know the, the 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 struggles and the challenges you know that are involved. Um, but um, I think we can also move on to our last speaker uh, uh, in from Hong Kong, where lands definitely <laughs> seem to be scarce. Uh, and uh, and that also um, uh, explains why you know uh, some of the uh, the uh, the agricultural practices uh, that we see now you know, um, springing up in Hong Kong is also you know in an vertically tied with you know the various movements we have in Hong Kong. So I guess it's uh, Chow. Uh, Chelsea Chong's turn to uh, tell us more about, you know, um, the, yeah, the, the context of Hong Kong. So please, yeah, I'll make you uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thanks, uh, Casey, for having me in this uh, panel. Um, just like, I, I mean, just like the third speaker, Palavi, I, I'm a little bit, um, uh, uh, I don't know really why uh, to put me in this panel as uh, I like to listen to uh, the sharing of all of you and I really uh, learn a lot and uh, all, all of your sharings echoes a uh, lot of things that I and, and our, our uh, partners uh, who are doing now in Hong Kong. Um, but I think I'll, I'll save my... Uh, responses or my questions in the second part of the uh, of the panel and I'll I'll focus on what I've prepared to uh, share in uh, in my part uh, uh, I think my sharing will focus more on um, on my a little bit about my own uh, uh, background or my position as uh, a, a former uh, activist uh, and then I changed to become a farmer in the past like I don't remember thir uh, 12 or 13 more than 10 years already uh, we've been farming in Hong Kong and then uh, my reflection on the problem of uh, the notion of uh, community development, which, which is the one, well, I, I believe is one of the key words in, in the title of the panel today. Um, but first of all, let me give you some uh, background of the situation of uh, agriculture in Hong Kong. Um, uh, uh, if, we are, if we say agriculture in Hong Kong, we are more or less talking about uh, vegetable gardening in Hong Kong because we no longer plant staple foods like uh, uh, rice or weeds or corns or beans in bulk in Hong Kong for a long, long time ago. I think more than half a century. Uh, uh, in Hong Kong, vegetable gardeners, uh, the vegetable gardenings in Hong Kong uh, begins after the Second World War, I believe. Uh, that's when uh, lots of uh, migrant farmers in the mainland China, they came to Hong Kong to find a piece of land to make a living. Uh, that's when uh, vegetable gardening started in Hong Kong. Uh, in other words, uh, the vegetable gardening in Hong Kong, I don't know if it is, uh, is a, uh, it, it lies a, a, a a significant difference from other places, uh, the vegetable gardening doesn't really have a tradition in Hong Kong because uh, the migrant uh, uh, vegetable gardeners are coming from all over China to settle down in Hong Kong. So we, uh, there is no such thing as the traditional vegetable gardeners in Hong Kong. They have their own species, they have their own seeds, they have their own techniques and a combination of uh, variety, etc, etc. Um, however, as, the, as, the, as Hong Kong as a city developed throughout the post uh, Second World War period up until now, the vegetable gardening, I think, uh, 
peak in late 70s and early 80s and then started to like decline in terms of the the tonnage and also the values of production and in other words it has been in a declining curve for around half a century so when we um when we pick up uh, or when we started to learn farming in around 2010 uh the the the, the current situation at that time about vegetable gardening is uh, pretty um pretty uh how how do i say we don't have much reference because uh, there is there were not so many farmers already there at that time in hong kong already and uh we kind of uh, learning from scratch and um and uh uh yeah it feels like uh it's difficult because uh, uh we we all of us training up as uh as uh, people who attend to school, uh, go through examinations and things like that, we are not uh, so used to work by our hands. Um, so th this is one part of the of the background in Hong Kong. Uh, and then uh, another part, another uh, um, another point about the background of Hong Kong agriculture is that uh, um, in the near, um, I mean, maybe 10 years or 20 years, uh, the remaining agricultural land in Hong Kong, which is already a, already a very small pieces of land, is continuously uh, being eaten up by uh, urban development in association with the integration uh, with mainland China. By that I mean, uh, originally the the, pe the the part of agricultural land which is just next to the border between Hong Kong and uh, mainland China is also becoming the target for big development, uh, turning the agricultural land into uh, a new the, the 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 metropolitan of the next generation, etc. etc. So um, uh, and both the government and also the private property development company are like um, hunting for the remaining rest of the agricultural land in Hong Kong, which is making uh, the rent goes up and then uh, is making the, the general environment, I mean, physical environment of agricultural rather difficult because uh, if I mean, if we are farming on a certain piece of land, but then we are surrounded by other pieces of land, which is already acquired by the government or acquired by the private company, they will put agricultural waste, like big blocks of concrete, and then all those kind of big pieces of rubbish around or inside their own land. And then we are ending up surrounded by those, uh, those, uh, big pieces of uh, garbage or, or big pieces of things. This is again, making the uh, environment rather difficult. Um, so with all these uh, background, uh, let, let me uh, talk a little bit about our trajectory, but I'll be brief. Um, we started our learning of farming as a result of also a uh, uh, campaign against uh, a social movement campaign, which is which was about uh, uh, protesting against the construction of the express rail in Hong Kong, which connect uh, Hong Kong and mainland China in a very, very fast fashion. And uh, we are imagining that the track or the rail uh, is like, uh, it's like a step with a very nice, a sharp knife. It cut through uh, uh, Hong Kong and, or, or it make a, I don't know, a, a canal between Hong Kong and China, a, a very strict line, a displacement line. It's a shorter distance line between Hong Kong and mainland China and then making, speeding up all the uh, interaction or exchanges of the people, capital, goods and goods and things like that. 
And uh, we think that it is uh, 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 another step or a further step to make Hong Kong again less self-reliance. Uh, because with such a fast track of uh, exchange of uh, material and capital and things like that, we, we no longer have to produce anything. We, all we can do is to make money. Just like John said, we, we, we work hard and then we make a lot of money and then buy bad things and cheap stuff and then we harm our body. Uh, but this is the only option we have because uh, our productive land is, is uh, getting less and less, is losing. We are losing our productive land. So at, at that time, uh, we, 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 we protest against uh, that against that uh, 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 construction of rail. And then we thought, well, why don't we try to follow the footsteps of the village people by learning uh, agriculture, by learning to farm. That's how we can, uh, I mean, we are very uh, silly. Uh, we are very, uh, I don't know, we are very naive at that time. We, we think, how can we spend a lot of time in the village? if we are not doing anything. So uh, farming seems to be a good option, seems to be a good option for us to spend a lot of time in the village. Of course, we didn't, at that time, we didn't count the factors of like physical assertion. We don't know it is very tiring. <laughs> we just, uh, we just uh, hope that we can gather people uh, and stay in the village and then uh, prove learning to farm, we can like really be a uh, village people and then things like that. We thought um, farming is, uh, is, the, is the tools and then community is the answer to our problem because Hong Kong is losing all the productive uh, uh, ability or skills or, or, or functions whatsoever. And then we, we, we are trying to build uh, at that time, we, we are aiming at building a community of production. We, 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 we are thinking that, well, what if a community of production can help us to be the starting point of like connecting to more and more people? Uh, that, that was the starting point that we are having in mind at that time. Um, and then uh, as Time goes by, we, we learn farming and then we are picking up the skills and then we are, one day we are, uh, we, we have produced enough to sell. And then, I mean, at that time it's also, it's, uh, it was a big deal to us because uh, uh, we've, we, we, we fed ourselves and then we have, uh, we, we begin to have surplus to, uh, to sell. And then we are one step closer to being uh, real farmers and things like that. But then, uh, I mean, uh, the, the problem uh, comes back or, or the, the real problem begin, began to arise. Uh, who we are, who are, who were we selling to? And who are the people in the city end to receive all this uh, ongoing production from the rural area of Hong Kong? And then um, uh, we started to... Uh, uh, organize our CSA groups and then uh, all those the different groups in the different locales of uh, in the cities and we also began to uh, to uh, make friends with the some of uh, the the little wholesaler that uh, brings vegetables from the rural area to the cities and then things like that uh, we began to uh, really connect the city through the medium of vegetables. Uh, I, I mean, that is one thing, that, that is one thing we always have in mind. We have all those ideals and we have all those uh, uh, rationales or values behind our management practices, uh, like uh, putting mulch and then making compost and then nourishing the microorganism in the soil, et cetera, et cetera. We want to convey all this message. We want to tell the people that agriculture is not about uh, damaging the earth. We are not extracting the last, very last resources from the earth 
through the very act of eating. We are not doing that. Agriculture can be healthy. Agricultural practices can be like very robust to the soil community. But uh, we can't just tell them it's useless. We, we have to tell them through the vegetable that they eat. Okay, that, that, that's, I mean, it is still the ideal part. I mean, uh, the problem is we find it very, very difficult to, to maintain those community in the, in the city. And then I, I think uh, that is when I, we, uh, we really feel the problem. Uh, I mean, if community is such a good thing, it uh, uh, develop relationships with different people, which uh, provide like support and then build networks and et cetera, et cetera. Why don't people cherish them? Why, why don't they see that, wow, this is a good thing. And then uh, we, we, let's, let's uh, build our community together. Uh, in, the, in our experience, it wasn't so much this case. And uh, I mean, um, uh, I think every one of you must have like tons of uh, experience like this. Maybe we can talk about it in the, in the discussion section. What I'm trying to say is that we, uh, uh, my feeling is that we stumbled into the real problem. The uh, com uh, consumerist like lifestyle or our urban industrial uh, living is the very reason why community is so difficult if we are not saying impossible. If we think about the everyday routine of uh, like urbanized, uh, uh, everyday routine of like office worker or wage earning labor, they have to like work five or six days a week in order to gain a little salary so that they can spend elsewhere. And probably if they're tired, they don't want to cook at home and then they want to eat somewhere during the weekend or uh, invent some special occasion that they can go out and dine out and to celebrate. And then uh, when uh, foods from different kinds of origin, different cuisine, Japanese, Thai, Indian, Italian, French, every kind of cuisine, like waving their hand, look at us, look, look at us, uh, spend your money in us and I'll give you some extraordinary experience. And then, what are us? We are, we are growing pak choy and then we are growing uh, uh, lettuce that are just uninteresting to them. And then uh, it, for a farm, because if, if, if we uh, keep on growing, continuously, we will have produce uh, harvest, uh, picking out continuously. And then uh, for people who subscribe our CSA program, they, are, they, they will uh, receive our vegetable weeks, week by week. And then it's a burden to them instead of, uh, instead of uh, like surprise or a gift or things like that. I, I, by saying that, I don't, I, I don't, I really don't mean to blame anyone. I, I mean, the way of life in the urban setting. They create this kind of uh, very tense uh, uh, and very, um, uh, people are just having not enough rest. Uh, 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 it is rather difficult to, to uh, let them enjoy the the fun or the joy of like preparing the food, cooking the food and eating the food and having fun together for a long time. Things like that it is uh, pretty difficult. Uh, so um, my reflection is that uh, in the very beginning, we, 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 we learned permaculture uh, and all those uh, management skills uh, related to the, 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 the way of farming. And then we, we see community development as an answer to our problem. But then I think, I, I think I, I'm not uh, hopeless now. That's why, I, again, I uh, agree with uh, Palavi's presentation. I, I think I'm still very hopeful. I, I, I'm just still showing this yesterday. So uh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, the real problem 
that we tech we have to tackle or we, we stumble upon is that uh 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 community development is not the answer it is uh it's not the answer of the problem that we have in our head but but a starting point or, 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 the, or, or the real questions that we have to engage if we are, we are, we are determined to, 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 how do I say, if I'm not exaggerating too much, to engage in a long fight or on a long time fight uh, to, to like change uh, people's taste or to, to engage in the uh, routine or lifestyle of the people. I think this is, the, a, a very real and uh, very realistic problem uh, to us. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, may, may, maybe uh, uh, that's all for me for, for now. And then uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the exchange and discussion. Next part. Thank you. See, um, um, I also definitely, you know, agree with you. Um, yeah, the, the, the kind of, Problems we, we 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 see in Hong Kong uh, as a of course uh, highly urbanized or uh, you know uh, context uh, where of course we grew up you know with uh, almost like a you know uh, an assumption that well life is going to be like this right urbanized you know everything is about high skyscrapers and of course our a uh, major form of socialization is going to shopping malls. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, where everywhere is so air-conned and, you know, stick and span that we forget about, you know, where these things come from and what the problem could be. And, uh, I mean, uh, I really do like, you know, what you were saying and sharing with us and putting on the table, you know, some of the problems that we face, you know, how... I mean, you know, even uh, with years of practice, you so firmly believe in, you know, uh, the, you know, the 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 charm, uh, uh, the advantages of, you know, permaculture or sustainability. How do we get these messages across, right? How do we unlearn and <laughs> uh, how do we help people unlearn the the harms of urbanization and and capitalism? Um, I do, you know, see that there could be, a, you know, uh, these could be fruits of discussion uh, and, and, and questions too. Um, so once again, thank you all of the speakers for your, for your wonderful sharing and uh, for the lot of food for thoughts you have already put on the table. Um, I think now is, uh, you know, the floor is open. Uh, I do welcome uh, questions, comments, feedback, or just anything, any response from uh, the audience, the attendees here. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, please post them on the chat. We've got you know quite a bit of time for a few rounds of questions, hopefully. Um, but I think uh, if this uh, is also open to you know, speakers who might want to give immediate response to other speakers or even questions, or after you know, some thoughts, uh, after hearing uh, each other sharing, anyone would like to pose a question or comments to fellow speakers? Uh, I have uh, two questions, one to uh, Annalisa and one to uh, uh, Palavi. Uh, uh, Annalisa, I, I, uh, you you mentioned that the activists in 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 the cases that you have mentioned was uh, they they are constantly uh, criminalized by the government. Uh, so uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, you you are you are uh, I mean um, I mean if the protest is uh, is okay with the law, then people go out and protest. But then if the government is intentionally criminalizing things that should be done how, how do we how do you and the organizations deal with that this is this is uh, my uh, first questions and for uh Palavi, yeah uh, uh, i'm very uh, i'm very impressed with your work uh that uh, that uh, uh that, that, that that that's done with the school and then I, i'm uh interested to know 
uh, the background of the school and also the children. Are they coming from uh, agricultural settings? Do they are they coming from like agricultural uh, farming families that uh, their parents know farming? Do they uh, or or what do you have to do? What do you have to do to like convince the school that oh wow. <clears throat> we, have a, we, we have a such program to engage the children to learn more about the nature and also the food that you're coming uh, is it a hard what what does it take uh in in your experience yeah this uh, my two questions yeah i think uh, a good question chow um it's an ongoing contestation so far like the spc spft farmers i i understand like even during the pandemic there was continuing harassments even in their areas, but uh, they had to deal it organizationally. Like they are very particular about their security within the community. They have, you know, they have their community guards. They are very organized and they have these ongoing discussions, of course, with uh, site authorities in, because they're already there in the land and they're in the middle of an, on, an oil pump plantation. So imagine these political harassments ongoing since they were there. But uh, it's also somehow like um, a test of their resilience and how organized and empowered they are. Because you're, you're talking here of uh, many farmers, no, uh, communities, no. And I think one of the potential also is the linking with, uh, like linking with ac academic institutions, linking with even site authorities who are kind of friendly with them like especially in promoting ag uh, organic uh, agriculture, natural farming methods. So these are, I think that helps them um, strengthen their organization. In the case of Timor-Leste, so far, um, as far as I know since the pandemic, there are some incidences when peasants were somehow apprehended because of the lockdown, but I guess it's not as very brutal during the time of the Indonesian occupation or probably even Portuguese colonization, no? So this time they're already there. And this, uh, the, the, the peasant union in Timor-Leste have somehow this level of uh, uh, negotiation with the, with the Timor-Leste government, no? The fact that this, you're talking here of municipal-wide peasant unions and they have occupied the territories kind of widespread, no? But of course, these are these are very fluid. So violence or maybe harassments would come in between. Like even in my experience in Bukidnon in the Philippines, uh, the peasant or the Talaandi tribe that I used to help or facilitate their land occupation movements, there was so much violence during the height of the organizing process. But so far, they are now in the process of negotiating for certificate of ancestral domain claim no we call it cadc in the cadt in the philippines the certificate of ancestral domain title so it's also important to have your leadership in the local polity or special land uh, let's say uh local government you you have leaders also or friends also in the uh in the community and local level because uh this is ongoing and you need to have allies also with civil society and NGOs and yeah, a broader multi-sectoral and even peasant alliance with peasant unions. So yeah, that's that's the reality show in Southeast Asia. Thanks, Polari. Uh, yeah, I um yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um I um very carefully and strategically chose a school where parents were already questioning issues about consumerism. Uh, it, we have an alternative schools network in India and the school was part of that. In fact, the person who asked me the question, Suhas, his school is also part of that network. Um, so there is a, there are already spaces like this in India. Um, so for example, if John and Iskandar have a community and they, they have children coming in, I mean, starting something like this with them would be so easy because the parents are already questioning are participating are intervening in some things um but still um you know it's not easy to get everyone involved as you all know but 
what I did was I, because I, I had a faculty position in a university, I, I used to run a food course. And there I had copied some ideas from some US university and they had a food and identity workshop. So I uh, thought, let me try it out with teachers. So I, before I even opened, I didn't mention Gandhi or spiritualism or any value system, nothing. I just knew that they were anyways growing food. I knew it was a single teacher effort. I knew children were limited involved, not fully. I knew they were growing vegetables and not farming. And I really wanted to push boundaries. Uh, but I needed a buy-in and uh, I needed few interested teachers. Uh, so I did a small workshop with them. It was called the Food and Memory Workshop. I cooked up a name on the spot. I mean, I just wanted them to associate with food through memories. And this was some six years back. Um, and it really worked well. I mean, they, they got so excited. They remembered all the stuff that their families did, what they did. And I got at least three teachers who came to me and said, let's do something. I mean, yeah, this is so nice. Let's do something. And we initially started with just let's grow vegetables. But what's the fun? Sorry about that, Chow. But what's the fun about growing vegetables? Just vegetables, you know. So uh, we thought we will... Um, uh, do something a little bit more, uh, you know, dashing, pushing. And we, we said, why not pick up this uh, underdog millet called Ragi? And then uh, on the spot, we thought of a name. So it was very uh, serendipitous, you know, it just went uh, as a flow. Um, but to your question, I've been thinking, you know, a, I, I have had a series of heartbreaks in community relationships. And I want to ask John and Iskanda that as well. Because the, the project doesn't run anymore. I mean, post COVID, we couldn't revive the project despite our you know, parents uh, invested in it. The, it gave a lot of publicity. We had a lot of media coming in. We had like, I wrote academic articles about it, but you know, here it is. I mean, I can't seem to put a community, I can't continue the community because a lot of good teachers left the school. And I, I don't think I'm very good at conflict resolution. I, I, I'm, I'm just reflecting myself as a leader. I, maybe I don't have the wisdom that it takes to take it for the long run. And I've been seeing really good teachers who are creative, who, who know why they're doing what they're doing and want to put in efforts, leave spaces which could have been just the right spaces for them to continue. I don't know. I don't know why. And I, I asked this, why did you not? I asked the school principal, why did you let her go? She was one of my best, you know. I don't know. And I, I don't know. I want to ask John and Iskandar as well. What God gives? What happens? How do you maintain? How do you sustain? I didn't, I was, uh, I saw Iskandar, you know, were you trying to ask a question? And, and now I think you have to respond to Palavi. Actually, it's very interesting. I've been following the, this group converse, conversation and it is an issue of, 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 of you know, being on the other side. Uh, again, something very, very big. Um, uh, either you do it in uh, 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 trying to sort of deal with the legal aspect of, uh, uh, of, of community, which is actually, you also end up will have to deal with the government uh, uh, before, you know, and then you also deal with the market with, the, with the, such a big uh, business uh, movement that uh, sort of uh, gobble up everything. Um, uh, si Chung was actually experienced it. I, I see it's very important for us to keep doing things uh, uh, inclusively, so not, not exclusively. Because if you're doing things exclusively, it's like you're asking for you're asking for a fight, and we are not fighting something small or even equivalent or anything close to what we are doing. The whole world is is going so fast into their own sort of modernization and greed that it's almost hard to have a hope on dealing with this big issue. This is why for me, faith is a promising promising uh, platform. Because within faith, at least you can can provoke uh, a person to person to change. Because it is a consequences of faith, whatever background of faith they are or they have, they will have to react on it. It's the consequences. You can't really say you are a faithful person and act sort of uh, uh, unaccordingly uh, by being uh, sort of a uh, 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 
a very very destructive person at the same time so it's it's it's, it's an effort that we have to keep on doing the other things about my place i think i'm also experiencing experiencing the same thing as a, a palefi sort of concern because over the 20 years we keep seeing good people come and go come and go come and go there is two two aspects of this uh, that we have to sort of have uh, what you call it our e class e class is uh, we have to let go because that's part of our learning course to let go uh, people uh, who have uh, that probably we thought it's a good person. We're expecting something very big from the person, but the young people nowadays tend to be very, very, they move from, from one experience to another experience in the fast track. They, they, you know, the fact in the old days, you know, you still have somebody that can be with you as a student for 10, 15, 20 years before you can hand it over the wisdom, the true, true wisdom for the person to continue. There is no such a patient nowadays and they want to rush in into the next job and the next experience. And you, know, you can't say anything about it. All you do is just have a better hope that they will find the meaning of their experience during the time they're with you and they will make a better place of, of themselves, of, uh, of their life and maybe they can also do something in in accordance to what we we hope for so it's 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 it's, it's very hard to to see this but this is a tendency that i i literally see within bumi langit we just keep seeing young people go and, and come and go and come and go uh, and really to to you know john will agree with me i think is 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 uh, to really really, really what you call it, uh, wraps into the wisdom of experience being with nature, being in a good social context. You need to be, you need to, to be present in that process for some time. You just can't, it's not a, it's not a, a, a it's not a instant things. And, and you can see, I think John, it will be the good example because he's become a, a reference, a place to go, to go home for a lot of young people or for a lot of seeker, people who seek for wisdom, you know, and this is what we have to do in life. We have to just keep on building our life that in the end, we will have people come to us to learn because we, if we actually just have a concept on, 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 on uh, provoking people to change sometimes it doesn't it doesn't come that easy, uh, uh, and I think patience is a is a is a very very important thing. Again, I say this is where faith is become very very relevant because with faith, patience is is the number one thing, you know, and also the fact that with people with faith we believe that actually sustainability or blessing goes beyond present life. You know, so if you planted something now in this life, you don't, it doesn't have to be paid or you don't have to see the result now because maybe God doesn't want it to happen now because this is part of, you know, I mean, obviously it's a human mistake, but, uh, uh, but the world is certainly not into a, going into a better place or a better condition, but the small things we do, what is really count. So keep doing the small things and, 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 you know, and, and uh, be sure about it because as a matter of faith, being, being patient is certainly going to be paid up in the end. You know, and, 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 and that's probably my contribution to the concern of uh, Palevi and also uh, uh, Chung who are doing an incredible work. And I can imagine how difficult it is. I think John is in a better place because he has already become a master in itself. People will always come to him because they need him. It's, it's a value there, you know? So you have to keep on doing something until the value is there. So people will come to you because they need you. It's not like you have to come to people and change people because it's very difficult, especially people nowadays. It's so difficult to change. Thank you. John, can you... Yes, share with us more of your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, 
we did not try to change anybody. The mm -hmm. thing that we do, we try to solve our problem mainly because our problem is we have no freedom. We, it seems like we have a lot of freedom, but actually we have no freedom. So the real freedom has to be, have to come from ourselves, not come from the law, the government or anything like that. So what we try to learn is learn how to give us ability to uh, help ourselves. Whenever we help ourselves, that means the power is in our hand. But whenever we cannot help ourselves, that means the power is in somebody's hand who control us. So what we try to do is to try to bring back our ability, our skill. How can we do things ourselves more and more? But it doesn't mean we have to do everything ourselves. But it means we learn how to do things and connect to people around us who can do things good in something. Because we cannot do everything good by ourselves, but we can rely on each other. Self-reliant, it doesn't mean we have to do everything ourselves. To do like that, we don't call self-reliant, we call isolation ourselves. Self-reliance means everybody have to do what they love, do what they like to do, and then we relate together, help each other, depend on each other, but depend on the big system as less as we can. Like well now, our communities, we do homeschooling. We have many kids here. We don't send kids to the school because the school system is too big. When it's big, they make the curriculum for everybody, one curriculum for everybody. That's not the right thing to do because human is not a product from the factory. Human is human. Human have to be different. That's why we feel like we don't agree to send kids to school because we want kids to be themselves, to be different. Everybody have to be themselves to be different. I feel like uh, that's the beauty, that is security. Because if people think the same thing, do the same thing all over, that's the end of it. Because we don't have the biggest crisis. When many people do different things, think different way, and then we can rely on each other and help each other, learn from each other. So everybody can do what they love. I feel like uh, that is the most important thing. But it's against the capitalist system. It's again the consumer system because when people have freedom, when people help each other, when people do different things, when people think different way, it's hard to take advantage of people because when people do the same thing, eat the same thing, if everybody eat hamburger, it's easy for the company to take profit from everybody in the world. But if everybody eat different kind of food everywhere, that means they are independent. They have their own culture. They have their own way of living. They have diversity. And everywhere we will have diversity in our life, in our world. So everybody proud of themselves. But whenever we rely on one system, we cannot proud of ourselves. We just feel low, feel weak, because the system is so big and ourselves is so small. So I feel like what we are doing is good all of us we doing different things we doing what we like to do we doing what we have talent have skill that's good thing because it's different but the main thing is we all of us will face a lot of problem from the mainstream from people nearby because we do things different from other people so that's the big obstacle for us like for people who like to change their style of farming in Thailand to do self-reliant way, to do organic farming, the first obstacle is their parents. So they don't agree with that because you don't do what we used to do. You're wrong. So that's what will happen. So it's the same thing what we are doing, like probably start some school like that in Thailand, People do something like that. They will say, oh, I don't want my kids to be in the mud. I don't want my kids to play like that. I want my kids to read books, to study in the room. It's dirty. So that's what many people think about. So 
something like this. I think we need to be strong. We need to have confidence to do what we are doing. So nobody make mistake. We just do what we like to do. Whenever we do it good, I think it's fun. And then we can develop it to make it better and better. And one day people will say that you are right. So that's that's one thing I, I face a lot in Thailand here. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very inspiring. I already have, you know, a few questions that I would really like to ask and you know for further discussion, but I also see a question uh, on the your chat chat room uh, by Kinchi. Uh, asking Iskander, uh, could you elaborate your idea of incorporating sustainability with forgiveness? Actually, it's, 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 it's forgiving is, 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 is such an important sort of uh, aspect in, in life to keep on going. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I think we always been going to be put on tests in, in, in the relationship with, with nature and the relationship with, uh, with other human. And forgiving is, uh, is, is a very, very useful tool, useful sort of condition to, to be able to be on the right track, to be on the right path, because that will be the, 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 the sustainable play, uh, sort of track. The, the blessing will always be, be with you. And obviously, you know, uh, there is a condition where, you know, I mean, we also have to learn on uh, where we have to forgive and where we have to be more firm about, about our relationship. Because um, especially nowadays in the world where there is so much wrong spread right through the world, it's better not to be on the place where we're going to face uh, conflict, you know, um, and this is why, uh, you know, uh, there is even a guidance within Islamic uh, sort of tradition for us to go to the mountain when things go really, really bad in terms of our social uh, reality, because then, you know, there you can have the purity still with, 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 with nature, and that's where you can still maintain a good uh, relationship in terms of Forgiving nature is much easier than forgiving other human, especially if the human is already on the wrong track, where they always do uh, destruction rather than doing anything good. You know, and uh, being emphasis on 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 John on on our sort of daily activity actually is being useful is the most important uh, uh, mechanism uh, to 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 have. But the objective uh, usefulness, not the subjective usefulness, according being useful according to what we need or for for a very small purpose of of of, of scope. So I think it's it's um, you know I mean it's it's an ongoing test. Forgiving life is uh, is is something that we keep on trying until with the time we die, basically. Thanks, Iskanda. Um, uh, I see that uh, Xiaohui. Xiao has a question for the speakers. So I have two questions. One is for John. The other one is for Iskander. John, hello, I'm Xiao Hui. I'm very honored that you come to our South South Forum. I have always admired um, Pam Pam Farm and also has visited the farm or to rent from you in the in the course of the uh, protect the diver diversity and with the with the you also had a group of young people how to use alternative ways to build all kinds of life forms so that we can be from the 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 the, the strengths from the constraints from the modern life and i i always agree with that especially in front of the climate change and the um, crisis from the capitalism. I think it's very it's inspiring. So my question is, in Thailand, the government has, what, what kind of regulation has the government on the, on the buildings? Which means that this kind of earthen buildings that you have in your farm, is it, is it uh, permitted 
uh, uh, under the structure of the government regulations because we know that the buildings yes can be can be used with some simple materials but to acquire a piece of land is it easy for the young people in thailand is it is it common and also like you mentioned the education in the community. We also agree with that. We have been carrying out all kinds of education in our communities, but in a in a longer term, when these kids when they are in front of this mainstream education system, I'm sure they might. I think they might have faced some kind of pressure. So what do, what experience you have? So my question is one is. The first one is about the regulation of the land, how to use the land and the buildings, regulation about the, the, the buildings. So should I also come up with the question for Iskander? Uh, Iskander, so you, ha you have mentioned about um, the, the Cosmo, Cosmo vision or in, the, in the region. And I have also visited your farm last year and you always emphasize the the, uh, the the pass on from the generation to the generation of the knowledge so so when you can produce food for yourself that is important you also mentioned that the capitalism was is trying to change us to consumers all this mechanic mechanism and also the factories and even the ai of nowadays they in the name of the productivity but at the same time they are kind of a uh, put pressure on the laborers and also encourage people to become consumer instead of producer to bear on debts to spend money so in front of this modernization to 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 put everybody inside this kind of uh, consumerism and modernization i wondering in the education of islam is there any kind of tradition that is to restrict the capitalism because nowadays they are very brutal and they do we have any knowledge from islam that can stop people from going to consumerism traps or or maybe you don't have a specific speech about that but maybe there are some ideas behind it that is supporting this kind of uh you know uh, practice that is my question thank you um, actually, in Thailand, we have law like many countries that you need to get permit to do building. But because of Thailand, is, they're not uh, very strict about the law. If you do building in the city, you need to get permit. You need to get the plan signed by authority or some people who are responsible for it. But in general, in Thailand, people do a lot of building by themselves. So they don't ask for permission. And many people build urgent building outside the city. So they build in the village, build in the rural country. There's, there's, there's no problem about that because normally if we don't build anything more than two stories, it's not very strict, not very serious. But if you build taller than that, it will be more strict. So normally we never ask for permission. And then sometimes we need permit from the government. It's, it's very hard to get the, the right permission because the architect or engineer from university, they did not learn about wall bearing system much. Mainly they learn about horse and beam system. So they don't have uh experience no idea about wall bearing system so they cannot sign the the, the, the design the group in for us that's why it's not easy to get a permit uh, to do urban building legally but luckily in thailand we are not very strict about that much because it's not very big building it's not uh in the big public area Maybe when we make coffee shop, when we make something like that, it's not very big, it's small. So people don't care much about that. And our culture is different from the developed country. Like in, in Europe or in America, if you build something, neighbor feel unsecure, they can inform the government easily. They can come and inspect you and ask you about a permit, thing like that. But in Thailand, we don't have tradition like that. You can do whatever. 
as long as there's nothing happen, there's no problem. So we have law, but we don't follow law much. That's inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's the same as in Indonesia. I think we are very lucky. We're not we're not uh, uh, over regulated. You know the regulation is there. That's why I mentioned as long you live inclusively, you know you don't live exclusively. You don't you don't invite enemies and especially government as an enemy. Then they will always uh, <laughs> uh, they're always capable on making a problem or creating a problem towards your establishment. Uh, but if you, you do it inclusively, you know, and, and you remain good friends because you are not in opposition, you're just trying to improve life. And uh, personally, if you approach them personally, they will agree that the fact a lot of, of the concern we raise and we emphasize in our center is their concern. They're concerned about the food they eat, the environment they live, you know, they are worried about it. They want to do something, but the things to do is not to make them an enemy. You know, that's <laughs> that's my strategy. I've been I've been living in the village for a, a more than 45, 50 years of my life. As long as you make a good friend with them, you know, and you don't try to become a, an enemy of the government, you know, you live peacefully. Hopefully, inshallah. Good, good, good. Now, Iskanda, um, Xiaohui was meaning to ask you that, uh, um, of course, we're very inspired by, you know, what you were talking about, um, how Islamic faith, you know, informed your practices. Now, um, now, as we all know, you know, because of, you know, rampant capitalism and, you know, um, authoritarian government, you know, what we have been, you know, sort of fed with is, of course, you know, how consumerism is so good for us, right? Industrialization and modernization. So I think Xiaohui was trying to ask, you know, if uh, there's anywhere inscribed in Islamic um, literature or, or, or faith uh, about, you know, of course, capitalism, how can we deal with capitalism? How can there be any sort of uh, limitation uh, how can we control capitalism from expanding like what it is now? Oh. Uh, how can, how is there inscribed in the Islamic faith? How can we really realize uh, social justice in the midst of rampant capitalism? Yeah, I think it's in, in, in Islam, it's, it's certainly a touch on almost every aspect of guidance that we need in our life. Uh, and 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 about uh, about capitalism, if you see the underline of capitalistic lifestyle, is living excessively. You know, uh, we have a right in our life, but our right is actually all being being measured. You know, everything in nature we have a right, that, but we cannot take more than what 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 belong to us. Even among other human, we have a right in the forest, we have a right in the ocean, we have a right in the river, we have, we have a right in the soil, but you cannot take more than what, what really it's, 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 it's there for you as a human overall and as a personal, as an individual personally. So obviously everybody has a different right personally, depend on where they, they live according to the how, how, how generous the soil are, how generous the ocean are. But, but we can say there is a measurement that we have to accept. And that measurement is very much a part of the old wisdom, old knowledge. People in the past wouldn't take more than, let's say if a forest only can give you 10 trees, they wouldn't go to the forest and cut 20 trees because they say it's against my my, 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 my inside, you know, conscious doesn't allow me to take more than what belong to me. Uh, so exploration is, is encouraged in Islam, but exploitation is discouraged, almost is for, forbidden to exploit, to take something more than what belong to you. Like for example, if somebody good at making a, a, a garment, a shirt or a product of, of a garment, if a person needs only three shirts in a, in a, in a year and he make basically produce 10 shirts and manage to sell seven more shirts to the person, 
he's actually doing some mis uh, mischief. He's doing something de destructive because he makes the person uh, uh, buy or use more than what he needs. So basically, it's 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 a uh, uh, it's like misguided somebody. But that's the whole basic base of the modern lifestyle is to make everybody excessive to use more than what belong to you. And, 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 and so, you know, I think this is, we, we really have to remind ourselves, I think the same guidance is, is exists in every religion, you know, that being excessive is a problem of life, of human humanity, because you, how do you see that we actually become excessive because you create pollutant waste. Waste wouldn't exist. Pollution, pollutant wouldn't exist if you don't if you're not excessive. If you're excessive, it, if you use more than what you need, then obviously the consequences you're going to create waste. And waste is appearing, uh, uh, waste appearance is in every aspect of human human uh, 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 community or human sort of culture now. You know, we always create waste and waste is actually, it's something that against the will of the creator. And when a waste is the sign of a failing system, waste is the contrary of sustainability, the contrary of blessing. When there is waste, there is no blessing. So it's a, it's a very, very simple way of, of, of looking at it. It's a, it's a kind of, a, the way I express it is black and white. But obviously there is a lot of gray area also in it because some ways can still be conferred to something good, but some ways is completely un, <laughs> unchanged. Once it's become bad, you know, maybe you can recycle one on twice, but then there is a price to pay, you know, and, and I believe uh, in, the, in, the, in the perspective of faith, you don't only pay it on this world, but also you have to pay it on the, on the next world. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing problem in our uh, sustainability uh, in the context of spiritualism, because we still have to be accounted for on the next life. So I hope that's the answer. It's a, it's a big question, but I'm glad it's being asked because uh, uh, Islam has certainly something to offer on this. Even most of the uh, sort of uh, mainstream Muslim who are being dragged into this consumerism and capitalistic sort of lifestyle doesn't see it that way. Thank, thanks, Iskandar. Um, totally agree. Um, um, would there be any more questions from, um, yeah, from participants? I, I do actually have a, a question for uh, Pallavi and uh, maybe Anna too, um, because uh, uh, especially for Pallavi, um, uh, I also understand that you've got, uh, um, part of your project is about um, curating stories, right, uh, called Living Utopia. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on that, uh, because I find it, you know, really, interesting and inspiring, you know, to bring in, you know, um, like documentation or even stories, you know, as a part, you know, of, of, of the project. Um, and, and I think over here, you know, we, uh, you know, in, in my other uh, projects too, you know, we talk about digital humanities, right, uh, as a way to help document, you know, um, uh, stories of different people, also by way of using the stories to spread messages of uh, sustainability or, you know, or, or you know, uh, 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 empathy, you know, for the marginalized. Uh, maybe, um, Ms. Pallavi, you can just elaborate briefly uh, how, you know, you, um, you know, what you have reflected uh, based on those, uh, uh, that project of curating stories. Okay, so um, since the last five years, my colleague uh, in India and I, we decided to curate a set of stories of alternatives uh, of uh, mainstream development, mainstream growth, and we, we use the word industrialism. So these were counter forces to industrialism and we went around looking at, um, if you look at civilization, so there is a political aspect, 
a technological, uh, economic, and a social aspect if you sort of divide it in your head like that. So we thought, let's look at stories, hopeful stories, of where are the alternatives to a certain kind of democracy and politics. So we looked around for direct democracy, uh, we looked at face-to-face -face participatory democracy examples, uh, for example, Zapatistas, uh, Menda, Kinchi has been a comrade for so long. So we have we have had a, a sort of stock, stock uh, taking of uh, where this course went. It's offered in a form of a course. Uh, we used to run it as a semester-wide course in the university but now run it as a community. In fact, today uh, today is the day my colleague is traveling uh, to offer it to a small community in the middle of India, central India, um, uh, just to activists, whoever's interested, uh, you know, what are they thinking? Can they get inspired by the Zapatistas, by some village stories in India, by people like John Iskandar or Chao, if we are, you know, I'll include you in my stories from now on. Uh, so politics and economics. So, uh, and, and, you know, your uh, write up for this conference is very similar. Thinking New Horizons is exactly that. So can, can ecofeminism, can degrowth, can Gandhi, can Tagore, can Islamic religious significances, can they come together? Yes, and Suhas has rightly written. So in India, there is, there is it's taking off, it's taken off. Um, and our course just is like an educational initiative. It just if you have some three days, two days, six days, we can curate a course for you, just to give you some ideas on alternative economics, circular economy, Dundon economy. John said, started by saying self-sufficiency. So what does self-sufficiency mean? Where are the examples? What's happening in the world? Uh, appropriate technology. So those are all, whatever you guys talk about, I talk the same thing, but it's an education initiative. That's it, yeah. Um, uh, the reason I raised this is also, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm also in the institution of, you know, tertiary education. And uh, something uh, that I was actually trying to look into is of course the, you know, how, you know, how from a pedagogical way we can, you know, sort of uh, sustain our messages, uh, sustain messages of hope, you know, especially in, the, in times of difficulty. So I, I guess I, I pose this question also as a response to, you know, uh, um, uh, I think it's Gunners and John's earlier sharing, you know, how, how do we, you know, spread these messages uh, to especially young people, right? Especially about, you know, uh, something about heritage, something about indigenous culture, uh, something about Islamic faith, which to, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't even, you know, just want to stereotype the youth, right? <laughs> Maybe even adults, right? Like, oh, what? <laughs> you know, these are all very boring and, you know, why should we care about our, my heritage, for example, right? When everyone is about, you know, global popular culture, you know, everyone is about, oh, you know, the latest fashion trend, you know. So I think this is a this this is a you know um, a question about pedagogical challenge. How do we you know um, continue on spreading these messages of hope uh, to you know uh, people who have benefited from like John, you know, uh, who has been receiving a lot of guests, you know, from different times and you know. How do we, you know, sustain, you know, help them sustain too, you know, help them sustain you know, these messages of hope it, when they bring, you know, these messages back to their own communities. I guess, uh, yeah, this is probably for everyone <laughs> on the panel. But yeah, anyone would like to take that up? Can I, can I just, just add to it that uh, we do it through uh, storytelling. Uh, we do it through audiovisual short films. Uh, we also have like uh, vernacular languages. So we do not try to reach out to our university educated audience because we are hoping that these ideas will be translated. And so we do many strategies pedagogically. Uh, we have lecture notes, we, we do many things, but in workshops, residential spaces are best discussions. So yeah, 
we tried online and it didn't work out very well. So there is a um, global network called Pedagog. I know that um, Aban is also part of it. Uh, and we discuss what pedagogies will work uh, with each other. So that's also um, something that you can plug into. Um, yeah. Angeng or Tichong? Yeah, I think I want to add, I mean, it's already mentioned before, especially by John, about the importance of food. I think, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I think the representative of women in this, uh, in the present in this talk, then also maybe the audience is quite big also. I think food is one of the area that we have to put so much intention and effort to trying to guard the importance of, of food because, of, 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 and also food is also the connection to the past. You know, most of the wisdom of the past is carried over through the food that not only how we grow them, how we cook them and how to eat them, how we collectively sort of do all the works towards this, 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 these things that we call food. And, and now I think food has become such a sort of indust an industrial sort of mechanism, more or less a, a financial sort of driven uh, and become so simplified that uh, I think as a woman, we have to really remind uh, uh, sort of, uh, again, uh, the importance of guarding the kitchen. Kitchen is the last gate uh, uh, before, before everything is broken up, you know, when kitchen already being invaded by the industrial sort of uh, 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 processed food, then there is no blessing. You almost can say the blessing is so hard to be present even though you know God can do whatever He wants, blessing can still be anywhere He He wanted to be. But uh, logically, we can say that if there is no good presence in our kitchen anymore, in terms of the inheritance of the past, the blessing that being carried sustainably carried from the past into our life, and also how it is important for us to also hand it over to the next generation. Uh, 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 it's, it's, it's something that becomes so important to, 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 to emphasize. And uh, again, you know, I love kitchen. I, 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 I mean, again, I actually, my wife uh, is being, being, I sort of, I wouldn't say I use, my wife love to do it, but you know, I, uh, as a team, I always encourage my wife to sort of be creative on 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 the kitchen the kitchen used to be the biggest place in the house you know i mean a generation away you do we do everything in the kitchen we receive guests in the kitchen we sleep in the kitchen we play in the kitchen we we we, we have ceremony in the kitchen uh, everything you know we receive relative in the kitchen and now kitchen is become such a simple one by two meter sort of space stuck in the corner of your uh, of your house with a microwave and maybe with a uh, refrigerator, so it's a uh, it's uh, it's it will be beautiful if it's a lot more story is being made uh, around the kitchen uh, because I think when you start talking about kitchen you automatically see the the, the beauty of having few few pots if you only have a meter square or two meter square around your house suddenly the beauty of having a a few pots in your in outside of your kitchen and become uh, become uh, something important. And in, again, if you have bigger land around your property, you start to instead of growing all the ornamentic plant, you start to grow more of the edible plants. And uh, I think I'm, I always encourage the importance of kitchen to everybody that come across Bumilangit. And we do a lot of work in the kitchen uh, on on processing. Of, uh, fermentation, uh, salting food, uh, drying food, uh, food, and also uh, what you call it, uh, uh, smoking food, because it's 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 all rich with with wisdom. So I think that's I, what I add into this. Thanks, thanks. Um, Anding, do you have a brief? Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, perhaps maybe um, my sharing would be like, how do we move forward? No, from all these. Uh, challenges that we face i mean it's good for it's good to know like some of the speakers here have somehow that kind level of security 
that you do not have you do not have to face evictions you don't have to face land grabbing but for our partners in the research these are communities these are peasant unions who are every day in the struggle in the resistance no in in the in the protest in the you know in the movement building against capitalism against uh, land grabbing land conversion etc but on the other side of the fence you see them outstanding um projects about alternative sustainable farming organic agriculture no so it really goes hand in hand so this is my explanation about agri ecology uh, uh previously because it's not just about technical uh development and management of land it is also about science social process and reproduction of uh of communities no it's about diverse uh, social arrangements that we experience uh through their their to their level of experiences and day to day living in relation to land no so um well the hope there so far we have this movement we call it the movement for alternatives and solidarity in southeast asia um which is masa so in english the masses no um this is a somehow like a new movement of alternative practitioners in Southeast Asia. And we have this uh, vision, of course, that it has to be something like a regionalism from below. No, it has to be a people-to-people -people solidarity, not state-to-state, -state, but it's about uh, intersectionality of our struggle, you know, integrating queer LGBT groups, um, women, uh, the youth, no, intergenerational approach in terms of uh, this intersection farmers to workers no there's there's a lot of things to learn women based home based workers like the home net uh southeast asia so there's a lot to learn from all these convergences so it's been going on like on our case up seeds is uh conducting the yearly regional conference on alternatives so we're hoping this year that it's going to push through face to face this time because uh in the past in the past years, we need to uh, divert it into online. So there's a lot of things like, in a way, it's also promising that we see a lot of young people, like in the case of uh, Indonesian peasant movements and Timor Leste, even in the Philippines, no, they're engaged in all these uh, conversations about alternatives. So I guess that's that's uh, that's the hope in moving forward uh, in the discussion about land occupation movements the viability of that, and at the same time, the future of agroecology in the hands of these peasant uh, unions and peasant communities. Thanks so much, Anging. Uh, what, a, what a nice way to bring us on to, you know, uh, to our last session, because I'm also aware of the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the last uh, round, uh, we're supposed to have you know, uh, two or three minutes from each of you speakers uh, as a wrap-up uh, or some concluding thoughts you would like to, you know, uh, yeah, um, enlighten us uh, at the end of this panel. Uh, two to three minutes, yeah. Uh, could we start with John following on the uh, original order of the speakers? Yeah, I actually, I, uh, I agree with Iskandar that we need to start it from our kitchen, from our life, to, to pass on something to the next generation. The best thing is just to do it, use it, or live on it. That's the, the, the best way. Like we do seed saving. We, the way we do is just try to grow them and eat them and make them be, become one part of our life. So if we keep them, use them, it will alive. It will pass. It will be passed on to the next generation. But if we just save it in the room, it never go anywhere. But when I die, it disappears. So I think knowledge, skill, and everything, it can be the same way. Even thinking, belief. Even we think about democracy. Think about the respect of other sex, other people, we need to start from ourselves first. Start from ourselves, our family. How can we respect our member family 
equally, we start from here. We use it in our real life, and then it will be passed on to the next generation automatically. So we don't need to work too much. Just use it, live with it. That's it. That will be the easiest way, I think. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, Iskander? Uh, okay. I think John has uh, put it in a, a beautiful way. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, important for us to keep the wisdom alive. You know, there's a lot of way to keep the wisdom alive. And the concern is actually of the crisis of humanity is uh, losing the wisdom. And I mean, it's a reminder, it's a beautiful reminder for everybody else, but within this Islamic teachings, it's a, uh, in the faith sort of uh, look at it um, that there is only three three things that still count on on us after we pass away after we we die and the three things is the, uh, the the deeds that we do the good deeds or the deeds that we do during our life and the the, the second is actually the useful knowledge that we actually uh, are become part of uh, all um, during our life and the third is a pious uh, 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 daughter and son. So, and th th this is actually, if you look at the, the, the meaning of sustainability, it's become very beautiful because what, what, what lacking now is, is the, this, the, 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 the death of the tradition because there is nothing of the good uh, deed that are being uh, uh, done by our parents that they got from their parents that they got from their parents onward uh, uh, to the to the past and also the good knowledge the same way that being carried uh, by their uh, children and the only way to make some uh, the, ch the children become pious is actually to do to continue that tradition you know so it's not merely to be uh, expert on the, on the revelation aspect of religion about, you know, ability of, of knowing the religious knowledge, but also the, the, to how to continue the wisdom of, of, of life itself. So I think, you know, our, our, our grandparents are, are suffering on, 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 on the other side uh, now because we are not, we're not sending them blessing because that's the only things that still mean to them in the other side is the good things that they have done, the good knowledge that they have done in while they were in the world that being continued by the next generation. If we stop con continuing the, 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 that aspect of what they contribute, then they're not receiving any blessing on the other side, which they really, really need. You know, I mean, this is again, a perspective of faith, obviously. So, you know, that's, I think, you know, I, I think if we can look at that, we can be really concerned of the quality of, 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 of our sort of, uh, sort of uh, children uh, and the children to come on how they actually can nourish us after we actually pass away on the other side of the world. And because we really depend on this nourishment uh, uh, before the day of counting. Anyway, that's just a reflection of a spiritual reflection. So thank you very much for this uh, beautiful time. And <laughs> I hope it's, uh, it's got some meaning. Yeah, thanks to you, Iskanda. I think you, you well articulated uh, you know, how important it is you know, for uh, religion, uh, for uh, and also Islam uh, in our, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, awareness of humanity here and, and the work we do. Um, may I just uh, proceed on to um, uh, Palabi, right? Lisa, don't make me speak after John and Iskander. I, I mean, there is no profound <laughs> statement coming out of my head because of these two <laughs> who say it all and say it so well. So I'll just, I'll just say that, yeah, I mean, I started my whole thinking to, today about hope and sometimes it dips and sometimes it takes a upside and thanks to forums like these, I mean, telling us to move on and go on. So thank you so much. Well, someone has to. <laughs>
take up from that. Uh, okay, but thank you very much, Malavi. Um, uh, Anging, I suppose you, you, uh, you did, did you have one word to say or no? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, Sito? Yeah, uh, uh, very, very quick. Uh, I, uh, within the, uh, the design principles of uh, permaculture, there is one uh, about uh, valuing the margin and the uh, marginal types of group of people or uh, lives. And uh, the, the imagery of that is, uh, is like imagine a river, a very uh, wide and very speedy river. But uh, there is always a certain point where the river has to turn a little bit left or a little bit right. And that's when the speed of the water slow down. And then uh, if we look at it from a uh, like microscopic perspective, that little turnaround is always like an exception or it's like um, right, a, 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 a system era kind of status. status. But then uh, that kind of place where the water, the, 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 the speed of the water slow down there is there will be places where lives emerge and then because of the speed slow down the water will not just flow past and then people can settle there and then things can happen and uh uh i i try to connect them with all those experience and also faith uh, uh, and the wisdom of the uh, speaker that who have just as uh, uh, shared it their thoughts with us and um uh because i i don't have any faith in particular i mean religious faith in particular i i try to uh uh stand on this kind of imagery to uh to uh, uh go on doing our work and then try to imagine that all of us here are the people on this turn around little turn around point and then i think it will make us uh I don't know, stronger or more persistent or uh, yeah, things like that. And so uh, uh, thank you, uh, the, the organizers and all the speakers. Uh, I, I enjoy this uh, discussion a lot. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, this has been a very inspiring uh, panel most of all to someone like myself, you know, not, a, you know, haven't been practicing, you know, anything that has to do with farming, but uh, I mean, thanks to the good work of uh, Si Chong and uh, Kim Chi, you know, yeah, uh, like uh, Kim Chi's project here, Lingnan Gardeners uh, at Lingnan, yeah, I do witness students, you know, how through, you know, doing a bit of farming on campus actually made them realize, you know, how, what they can do, you know, with their, just a pair of hands, right? Which way really made me, you know, think uh, how just laboring, and laboring with, you know, soil uh, empowers someone so much, right? By giving people you know, the sense of the sense of uh, agency, the sense of independence, the sense of autonomy, and um, and I thought, you know, yeah, I think it's a it's a simple message, uh, a very spiritual one, to you know that farming actually, you know, sort of helps us uh, relocate humanity in our place right our place how we relate to um the uh, nature how we relate to the earth and therefore you know how we relate to other human beings so i thought you know this is you know this is could be you know a simple message but a very spiritual one uh which also you know uh, uh stresses hope <laughs> at this you know more difficult times um and the humility you know to bring human beings back you know to where you know our place are you know in this whole entire universe itself it's a very you know, spiritual mass message but i'm sure you know the wonderful sharing you know by uh, all the speakers uh today at this panel is a, a, itself you know a very you know strong message of hope for all of us <laughs> to sustain you know our <laughs> our you know our practice uh and uh with this hopefully you know that would also sustain us to help other people sustain themselves 
so with this, I hope, uh, you know, uh, we could conclude and end this panel, uh, taking away a lot of things, uh, food for thought that we could carry on, on uh, to tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have, you know, uh, um, another round panels uh, at this forum. So hopefully we can continue on uh, what we have left off today. But thank you so much. And I hope uh, that all the participants help me and join me. And thank you all of these speakers for their wonderful sharing. Um, thank, thank you, you so you. much. <laughs> thank you all of thank you. And I hope we can stay in touch and keep sharing. Thank you. And thank you. This community. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.